Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our Digital Inclusion Now, a pathway to economic mobility for Black and Brown DC residents. Um, this is a webinar um, hosted uh, by CNHED during our Community Development Week uh, with our partners, uh, Bite Back and Capital Clubhouse. Uh, we'll get started um, kicking off our presentation now. Thank you all for joining us. Just wanted to begin with a couple of um, virtual housekeeping rules. Um, just so you know, this is a Zoom webinar. Um, so as you notice, your video is turned off. Um, only our panelists um, have videos and you'll be able to see them shortly. And you're also muted and you'll be muted for the entire webinar. Um, if you have um, questions, we ask that you use the question and answers function, which will be on the bottom of your screen. Um, our moderators and panelists will see them and answer um, as they wish. Um, you may also see a raise hand function on the bottom of your screen. Uh, and even though that's there, we ask that you don't use that. Um, that won't mean too much to us as we see raised hands. Um, of course, due to the large capacity of the webinar, we'll be uh, taking and funneling questions through that Q&A function that I mentioned above. Um, um, fourthly, we ask that you use the chat function, as many of you have already begun to do. Uh, you can chat with each other um, and uh, make comments as well. We ask that you um, also use the hashtag Digital Equity DC on Twitter um, as you hear uh, helpful and um, wonderful things through this, this panel. And lastly, um, if you have any technical questions, you can reach out to me, Precious Wrightout at pwrightout at cnhed.org. And finally, um, just so you know, this webinar is being recorded. Again, we thank you for joining us today. Um, of course, this is a panel about digital inequities within the district for Black and Brown, black and brown residents, uh, particularly during uh, COVID-19. Um, we have a wonderful um, um, panel of speakers and local experts um, on, the, on the ground working daily um, and in the field for many years to speak to these issues. So we're looking forward to hearing this discussion in depth. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Yvette Banfield, who is the Vice President of Economic Development and Wealth Building Strategies at CNHED. Yvette? Hi, thank you so much, Precious. Um, welcome, everyone. First, I'd like to share that Steve Baudet, the President and CEO of CNHED, who's unable to join us, sends his greetings. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today for today's virtual event, Digital Inclusion Now, a pathway to economic opportunity for Black and Brown residents. This virtual event is part of Community Development Week. It's a time when we, when we recognize DC's community development leaders. And this year, we are highlighting their resiliency, um, especially in this moment. And coincidentally, this week is also happens to be Digital Inclusion Week. Um, and I, I believe it's not only a national um, recognition, but it's international. And Digital Inclusion Week is focused on elevating the awareness of solutions, addressing issues to access, access devices, internet and local technology training and support programs. CNHED is thrilled um, to have partnered the past couple of uh, last two months actually with Bite Back and Capital Clubhouse. They are organizational members of CNHED. We've been working closely with them um, in planning and coordinating today's discussion that we, um, that we hope that you'll find informative, thought provoking, but more importantly, we hope that this um, event encourages you to get involved, to get engaged in supporting efforts to close the digital gap. I wanna take a few moments to acknowledge and give special thanks to Yvette Scores um, who's going to also be the co-host with me for today's discussion. So when you're not hearing my voice or the panelists, you will um, hear Yvette. 
and Margo Nitschke, who is also at Bite Back. Um, for, and I want to thank them for their openness and their willingness to the idea of collaborating. Um, we've been talking about convening an event like this for um, a number of months. And so we're glad and delighted that this is able, that this is able to come to fruition. It has been an absolute pleasure working closely with them. Um, they've gone above and beyond expectations in terms of working so diligently and it shows their, their passion for this issue. Um, and I also want to give special thanks to Anna uh, Galico, Galicio, excuse me, Galicio. Anna is um, a CNHED VISTA member serving at, at, at Capital Club. Um, Anna um, created a technology literacy resource that we'll be sharing in the chat feature um, with you today. So check out that link and you can also find it on CNHED's website as well as Bitebacks. Before introducing and passing the mic to Elizabeth Lindsay, the CEO of Biteback, who I might add is a rock star in her own right. I wanna emphasize the importance of elevating this issue around digital inclusion from CNHED's lens. Many of you know that CNHED is, is you know, well known for its housing advocacy efforts as well as its efforts increasingly around small business and closing the wealth gap for um, uh, minority owned businesses in the district. But our mission is to advance community development solutions that address inequity of under, under resourced communities in the District of Columbia. Our mission directly aligns in support of the move to ensure that digital inclusion is, is the standard. So now let me share a few words about Elizabeth Lindsay. Elizabeth is dedicated to helping thousands of people thrive in a digital society, to creating a pathway to living wage careers, and um, to influencing a shift towards a diverse and inclusive tech, tech uh, sector. Elizabeth Lindsay took the reins to become the head of Bite Back in 2015. And in, in a short period of time, a span of five years under her leadership, Bike Back has grown exponentially. She has expanded the organization's programming, transformed the earning potential of its graduates, and expanded Bike Back's geographic footprint beyond DC. A few of, of I want to share a few of Elizabeth's accolades, which include um, being named the Roots 100 Most Influential African American of, of 2019. Elizabeth serves on the Federal Commission Advisory Committee on Diversity, Digital, and Digital um, Empowerment, and is a member of the Mayor's Innovation and Technology Inclusion Council. I could say more, but we would run out of time. So, uh, but you get the picture. Elizabeth is on a mission to close the digital gap. And with that said, I am delighted to turn the mic over to Elizabeth to give her opening remarks and kick off today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvette. I am so thrilled to be here today and welcome to all of you. Um, it's weird not to be able to see the fabulous audience members, but I'm so glad that you all are able to be here today. On behalf of Bite Back, I have to express our sincere gratitude to Yvette and all of the folks at CNHED, at Yvette Banfield. This would not have happened without your passion, enthusiasm, excitement. And I also need to thank Capital Clubhouse for all of your incredible work helping us to plan this event. I also have to share Yvette's um, kudos to two members of my team, Yvette Skors and Margo Nitschke, who have um, done an incredible job of planning this in partnership with CNHED on top of their regular job. So thank you so much, Yvette and Margo. This is the first ever Digital Inclusion Week advocacy event. So welcome, this is such an exciting day. And as you all know, this event is called Digital Inclusion Now. Let me make sure I don't get it wrong. Pathway to Economic Mobility for Brown and Black DC Residents. 
people have started talking a lot more about the digital divide since the COVID-19 pandemic began. It's been really exciting for me to see that people understand that digital access to technology is important for people not just to survive but to thrive in the world today. I often say this but every, it's true every day I wake up and I feel so lucky that I'm able to work safely from my home and the reason I'm able to do that is because I have a computer, I have broadband and I know how to use technology and many of the individuals we see in DC and beyond who don't have these skills and who are um, what we now deem essential workers, people at grocery stores, people uh, driving Ubers, people uh, delivering our food to us, they are many of whom, many of whom are people of color and many of whom don't have college degrees. And across the spectrum, most of them don't have access to, to technology and the skills to use technology. And that's really why we're here today. Um, this is the fifth this is the fifth annual Digital Inclusion Week. It's an event that's organized by the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, an organization that I'm very proud to, um, I'm very proud to serve on the board of NDIA. And so this is the fifth annual Digital Inclusion Week for every year, every five years, staff from Bite Back have helped plan this event. And this is truly one of the most exciting events that I've been a part of um, to celebrate National Digital Inclusion Week. In digital inclusion circles, when we talk about digital inclusion, we talk about the three, a three-legged stool. You need three legs on the stool to be able to stay seated. And those three legs are access to a device. You need a computer, you need a laptop that works, and a cell phone is great, but not sufficient for many of the things we do every day. The second stool, the second leg on the stool is access to broadband that's sufficient for your needs. And then the third leg on the school stool is digital skills. So my organization, Bite Back, we're headquartered in DC. We have a site in Baltimore as well. That's kind of the leg of the stool that we focus on. We train adults, um, anyone over the age of 18. We have students from 18 to people in their 60s and 70s. We provide them foundational computer skills training. So we teach them how to use a mouse, how to, uh, what a home screen is, et cetera. And then they're able to stay with us on a pathway of digital skills training that leads to living wage careers. So they're getting industry recognized certifications in IT, administrative services, and others. And I'm really proud that at Bite Back last year, we had 57 of our graduates who moved into new jobs. And on average, they're making $23,000 a year more than they did before coming to Bite Back. That is the impact of having access to digital skills. It opens up a whole new world, a world that is full of possibility, a world that is full of opportunities for living wage careers. And so I'm really excited today that our focus is on that third leg of the st stool, the digital, it's so hard to say, <laughs> digital skills, because it's so absolutely essential. So I'm really excited for you all to hear from this incredible group of speakers. When I saw this lineup, I was like, this is the best group of speakers I've ever seen um, for an event. And so I know each of them is going to bring a unique perspective to this issue and to these issues. And each one of them is uh, working on the ground or is doing vital, vital research that those of us on the ground utilize to provide services that really change people's lives. So as you participate, we really want this event to help you understand the digital divide better. We really want you to see how you can get involved. That's our number one result that we're hoping to get from this event. We want you to see how you can get involved as individuals, as representatives of businesses, governments, or and as DC residents. So you'll see links throughout the event today where you can get involved. Please, please, please tweet. Um, the hashtag is hashtag digital equity DC. And I have to say that because my fabulous comms director is on and organized this event and Yvette loves Twitter and tweet. So please do that. It's important to really shine a light on these issues. And then also, um, please visit the new to get involved and to support our work. 
So finally, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce DC office, DC Chief Technology Officer Lindsay Parker. Love her first name. We share a name. Uh, Lindsay Parker was nominated by Mayor Muriel Bowser to be the Chief Technology Officer and confirmed by the DC Council in March 2019. Lindsay previously served as Mayor Bowser's Deputy Chief of Staff. As the district's chief technology officer, she works to enable DC government agencies to securely leverage technology to better serve the residents, businesses, and visitors of Washington, DC. We work very closely with Lindsay and we're so thrilled that you're here and I'm gonna turn it over to you and great to see you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we share this, this name. Um, no, such a great name. You. And it's spelled correctly. It's spelled so. correctly. <laughs> It's, it's just a wonderful thing. So, Elizabeth, thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. Um, I can't uh, say enough how important uh, your work is, um, how important um, all of today's speakers are. Uh, just incredible um, momentum that you've already started building, and uh, t today um, is sort of the next phase. And I can't wait to see sort of the power um, of the group uh, today and sort of what we'll all do together um, to, to address this issue. Uh, so you might wonder why I'm here. Um, my name is Lindsay Parker. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for DC Government. It's sort of a misnomer. I'm really the CIO for DC Government. Um, and I hope that you all can hear me. I'm having awkwardly some internet issues, which is you know never, never the right thing to have happened if you're the te Chief Technology Officer. But I wanted to, um, I was so thrilled to be able to stop by today because uh, you know, Mayor Bowser has one declared uh, this week uh, Digital Inclusion Week uh, at the behest of uh, Bite Back and many others. And so we really appreciate uh, our continued relationships and conversations and work together to address this issue. Uh, but the other reason that I'm really here, right, why is the CTO uh, stopping by to talk about uh, uh, digital inclusion? One of the things that um, I have realized in my year and, you know, nine months in my current role is that as a city, we cannot get smarter, right? People come and talk to me all the time about smart city initiatives. What are you doing with Internet of Things? How are you thinking about measuring water quality? We cannot even begin to think about all of those smart city things unless we're all connected. Uh, and so my drive, my passion, what I have put a lot of time in um, over the past uh, year and nine months, but especially uh, during COVID, is to think about a way to make sure that we are all connected uh, so that we can get smarter as a city uh, going forward. Uh, for instance, uh, we help with major application development. Uh, we help with all of the infrastructure. We own 800 miles of fiber throughout Washington, D.C. that connects our D.C. government buildings, as well as some federal buildings, as well as some nonprofits. Um, but the truth is, we cannot push out new services to our city and our residents and our businesses and our seniors uh, and our black and brown communities unless we know that they are able to access those services, right? It's, it's um, just not, not pertinent. Right now, we know during uh, this pandemic that some of those gaps, especially that we've seen in black and brown communities, have widened access to opportunities, access to education, access to medicine, right? Access to telehealth. Uh, and if we do not work together across government, nonprofits, uh, academics, uh, and, and industry to come up with a streamlined solution that's right for Washington, DC, we miss the boat. Uh, and that's not acceptable. Uh, and so I'm here to not only say thank you for having this conversation, thank you for your great work and continued efforts to do, uh, to, to, to address the digital divide. I don't like saying close it, um, or I don't like saying bridge it. I like saying address it, get it, get it solved for. Um, uh, and so what we are working on uh, in it, at the office of the Chief Technology Officer, officer is to uh, put together a partnership. We're calling it Tech Together DC. Uh, you can go and check it out at techtogether.dc.gov um, to do uh, to address some of those three uh, the the three prongs of that stool that Elizabeth just talked about. Uh, really, we're focused on four focus areas. One, ensuring that everyone is connected, has access to uh, internet. Two, making sure that everyone has a device and support. We know that there's about 50,000 households in Washington, D.C. that need internet, 
in that first focus area, and they need a device and a computing device, not a smartphone. Number three, uh, the third focus area is making sure that those same households have access to opportunities to demystify technology, making sure that they understand the benefit of utilizing that technology to apply for jobs, to continue their education, to access DC government resources and other resources online. And then the fourth bucket, so I have another, I have another uh, column on my, on my stool, uh, but the fourth bucket is really, if we are successful together at this, then we're gonna demand and need DC government to also come along on that digital journey, on that tech savviness journey. And how do we make sure that we are um, hiring DC government, uh, uh, sorry, DC residents uh, into positions where they are digitally able um, to help us make our services even better uh, to connect uh, via technology. And so um, again, this is uh, sort of a call to action. We are looking for partners. Uh, we are um, hoping to announce our first cohort at the end of next week, um, but still taking a lot, seeing lots of interest. Lots of folks are, are applying to be a partner, um, and we're excited about thinking through together how we move the needle on each of these four areas. We've just started moving the needle on that first first bucket by um, Mayor Bowser announced a little bit earlier uh, this summer uh, at the Internet for All program. We have $3.3 million to make sure that our SNAP and TANA families, oops, SNAP and TANA families are able to get home, free home internet uh, paid for by uh, Mayor Bowser, provided by RCN uh, and Comcast. And so we're working on that right now uh, and looking for additional funding to provide uh, a to, to provide internet for even more, uh, to, to really close that uh, 50,000 household gap. So uh, again, greatly appreciate uh, the time today and um, looking forward to connecting with all of you um, about how we can make sure that we're all taking a piece of the problem and coming up with solutions that stay around for a long time. Uh, so I really, really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, thanks so much. Good morning, and thank you to uh, DC CTO Lindsay Parker. Um, let me see. I think everyone can see me now <laughs> if we're on speaker view. Um, so I'm excited to see and continue working with um, Octo and see how Tech Together grows. And I couldn't agree more that digital inclusion is essential for tech growth in DC. Um, I'm still seeing Lindsay. Would you mind muting your video? Maybe that'll work. I don't know if that's just my view. <laughs> All right. I'm Yvette Scores. I'm the Communications Director at ByteBack and the co-host for today's event, Digital Inclusion Now, a Pathway to Economic Mobility for Black and Brown DC Residents. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I'm really thrilled to see the enthusiasm for digital equity because it's a topic that I care about personally and as a DC resident, I think it has huge implications for our community. Um, I'd like to thank my co-organizers. You heard from Yvette Banfield this morning. Um, she's been amazing. Also at CNATD, Precious Rideout and Hallie Henry for helping out. Anna Galicchio at Capitol Clubhouse and my coworker, Margo Nitschke. Um, and all of the panelists today. So we have two panels um, coming up today and we'll head into our first panel shortly. But first uh, we have a poll for you to answer to kind of see who's in the virtual room. And Margo's gonna cue that up for us. Looks like the poll is in progress. Um, so let us know who you are and who's here. I see those answers coming in. While you answer, I also want to encourage you all to think today about how you can make a difference in digital equity. Um, it really requires an investment and commitment from all of us, from DC elected officials, from our government agencies, nonprofits, employers, activists, residents, we can all have a part in this. And I want you uh, to see our chat for those links for resources. We have a great list of resources, um, especially if you're a nonprofit for DC residents for you to share um, and for you to sign up to stay involved in the digital equity movement. We have a Google form there. Thanks Margo for putting that in the chat. 
We also would love to connect with you here at Bite Back, and we have a brand new website, uh, biteback.org. That's B Y T E B A C K dot org. Um, we hope you check it out. We hope you like the new site. You can let me know your thoughts because I organized that project. Um, and again, we'd love to for you to share your thoughts in the chat and also on Twitter with hashtag Digital Equity DC. And I'll be tweeting along with you. So you can see the face behind that Twitter. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Um, I'm looking at our poll and it looks like we have a really good mix. We have about 59 of 70 voted coming in. Um, a lot of folks who work in housing and workforce development, education, some government folks, employers, um, tech people and DC residents. Um, I think that's an awesome mix of people and I'm really glad to see um, everyone here today. Um, next, I'm happy to introduce our first panel, Closing the Gap, Digital Access and Skills for, oh, I will share those results with you. <laughs> um, our first panel is Closing the Gap, Digital Access and Skills for Work in DC. And it'll be moderated by Mitchell I. Graham, the market editor of Technically DC, and an awesome journalist who frequently covers digital inclusion in DC and does an awesome job. Mitchell I, uh, I will hand it over to you. Hello there, how are you? Here we go, thanks. No problem. All right, hello everyone. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let you guys know what this panel will be about. It's the Closing the Gap, Digital Access and Skills for Work in DC. As Yvette introduced, I'm Michelle Graham, the Technically DC Market Editor. Um, I cover an array of tech, startup, and entrepreneurship um, topics in the DC region. So digital skills, the digital skills gap in Washington, D.C. is impacting how we work and who gets to work. The region is facing a tech talent shortage. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of residents still don't have a home, computer, internet access, or the skills to use a computer for key work tasks. Only 5% of white households in D.C. Only 5% of white households in D.C. do not have access to high-speed internet, while 27% of Black, Latinx, and Asian households don't have access. With the largest gap in digital access by income, in the country, it's essential that Washington DC works towards closing its digital divide. Today, we'll be joined by a few panelists. We have Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, Senior Fellow in Governance Studies, Director of the Center for Technology, Innovation, and Co-Editor-in-Chief of Tech Tank for the Brookings Institution. We also have Melissa Stallings, Chief's Program Officer at Bite Back, and Anne Marie Berstow, Director of Skyland Workforce Center slash building bridges across the river. Before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Talia Elliott Chandler to give us her story. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Um, I'd first like to thank Mrs. Uh, Michelle Graham, uh, Ms. Yvette Scorzy, and Lindsay Parker. Thank you so much for including me in a part of the panel. Uh, my name is Toya Elliott Chandler. I am a native Washingtonian and Ward 5 resident. Current, currently, um, I'm a Bite Back student in the CompTIA a certification course, preparing for my current and my career in IT. Unlike many of my neighbors, I've had foundational computer skills and internet for a very long time. So why did I need inclusion in the digital equity? Um, my story relates to work. I was going on interviews and was asked if I was a professional. It wasn't enough to have skills and work experience. They were looking for certifications. I've also experienced how black and brown people are ostracized. Even in simple jobs like data entry, employers require an IT fundamental certification for some workers, while others are hired based on who they know and if they are liked. It seems like there is a criteria just for us. 
that you have to have certain things when you walk in the door. So I'm getting those certifications and what I need. So you will call me back. We always have to be in a position where we have to be more ready as black and brown people. We're also not to the point today where everyone in DC has a chance to get digital skills, have a computer at home and have internet. If all DC came together to reach every ward, two things would happen. People could experience the technology field and grow and develop. It could be a starting point point for so many people to bring people left behind, including women and black and brown people into better career opportunities. I know many of my neighbors would be helped. I have older neighbors in need of internet and I have teenage neighbors just out of high school and they don't really, they're not really ready for college. They need bite back as a program to get their foot in the door and become more productive. If all DC, if all adults in DC had access to a computer, the internet and classes like bite back, it would have, it would cause four things to occur. It would mean the sky's the limit. It's an opportunity to branch out into every area of internet and technology. Having tech skills gives you so many areas to advance and develop and so many possibilities. D digital inclusion would and can transform DC for a better place. Our streets, our neighborhood, workplaces, and the economy would grow as well. Having Bike Back has made me less fearful of my future, especially during this pandemic. I'm extending my knowledge and education and taking the time to develop myself. And I know that as long as I keep showing up every day, I will get the skills. I've already earned my ITF certification and I will be earning my CompTIA a certification by the beginning of 2021. I'm going to have the search, the interview skills, and the direction for the next five years, thanks to Peyton Brooks at Bite Back and Andrew Quilpa at Bite Back and all of you wonderful, beautiful people as well. So thank you so much for the skills. Thank you so much for the inclusion. Thank you so much for for sharing and congrats on all of your success. All right, we're gonna go ahead and hop into the panel. If all my panelists wanna go ahead and turn their cameras on, um, we'll start off with some intros. Um, I'll have the panelists talk about themselves, their roles, and how they would define digital inclusion. Melissa, would you like to go first? Yes, hello everyone, good morning. My name is uh, Melissa Stallings and I'm the Chief Program Officer at Bite Back. Um, Bite Back is a nonprofit that provides a pathway of inclusive tech training that leads to living wage careers. Um, we've had over 23 years of experience um, in the work of digital inclusion in the District of Columbia. Um, we serve primarily adults and we are really focused on providing them skills training and those of course are offered at no cost to our students. Um, in 2019, we served over 500 students. Um, and we're really, really proud of that. Um, our student body is comprised of 60% women, and we also serve 95% um, individuals of color. Our graduates oftentimes who move into employment post-training um, end up earning more than $23,000 more than their pre-training income. So um, that I think is a really a huge testament to really the work that we're doing and really moving the needle around digital inclusion. Um, as Chief Program Officer, my role at Bite Back is really to support not just our programs uh, locally in the District of Columbia, as well as Baltimore, where we expanded to in 2019, but it's also looking at other markets that also need services like those that we provide at Bite Back and really helping to sort of replicate our program um, and our model nationally. Um, when we talk about or when we hear about conversations around sort of digital, um, the digital divide, it's oftentimes really focused on uh, uh, children um, as well as in technology basically. But I think that it's pivotal given the work that we do at Bite Back to really highlight the importance of adults being able to access um, technology and really having the skills to do so. Um, and so I, I think you know just want to kind of bring to light the importance of that and how um, the digital divide has really impacted work um, as well as our economy. Um, and so I'm really happy to be here in this panel and, and thank you, Michelle, for the introduction. Of course. Anne, would you like to go next? 
Sure, uh, I'm Amory Barstow. I'm the director of the Skyland Workforce Center. The Workforce Center is a project of building bridges across the river, the nonprofit that runs the ARC and the 11th Street Bridge Project. Um, and we're a collaborative of nonprofits, um, including Bite Back, um, that provide employment services. And we're located um, on the border of Ward 7 and Ward 8. Um, and when I think of digital inclusion, I just see all the ways that the participants at Skyland are left out from opportunities um, because of lack of computer skills, computer access. And I would add maybe, I don't know if this is another leg of a stool or part of the skills leg, but just the confidence to go in and use a computer and do what they need to do. And I mean, the pandemic has only amplified this as so much is now only available online and not available in person. Um, and we have so many people who really struggle with how to take advantage of these opportunities. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. Last but certainly not least, Nicole, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you for having me and good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee. I'm a fellow or senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and the director of the Center for Technology Innovation. And I'm really excited to be here. Thank you to Bite Back for the invitation. Um, and thank you to all of you attending, as well as the uh, District of Columbia for their efforts on digital inclusion. I have a very uh, interesting history with DC. Uh, almost 25 years ago, I actually called on DC in the efforts at a group called One Economy to help with digital inclusion efforts, working with the Workforce Development Program as well. And I come out before I actually finished my degree working in the digital inclusion movement. And I'm really excited to be here because I've spent this time over the last two decades really looking at digital equity but also in these last seven months, trying to figure out how to make sense of this all as we actually see this new digital normal that is overlaying with a series of systemic inequalities. So I'm excited to talk today. I do policy, but I also find myself talking to cities and educators and workforce development people, just trying to figure out how to contextualize this new digital normal so that we don't leave people of color behind. Because if we do, we run the risk of really appending every progress our note of progress that we've made for our communities in these spaces that improve quality of life. So I'm really excited to bring some national perspective this morning. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. Before we hop into the panel, I just wanna let everyone watching know that if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I'm sure we'll have a few minutes towards the end to answer any of those. And if not, um, I'll try to gather all of them and, and get some answers for you guys to share from the panelists. All right, so up first, our first question, um, this is for Melissa and Anne. Can you guys both describe how you see the current state of the digital divide in DC? Either one, you can take it away first. I can go first. Um, so, I, you know, it's, I think I wanna just sort of highlight um, something that was mentioned earlier, and that's that um, only 5% of households in the District of Columbia um, that are white households um, do not have access to high-speed internet. And when you compare that to 27% of households that are comprised of Black, um, Latinx, and, and Asian individuals that don't have access to high-speed internet, like that's a huge gap there. Um, and so I think, you know, it certainly is incredibly important for investments to be made in the District of Columbia to really close uh, the digital skills divide. Um, you know, we have a, an alum that I actually sort of has, has brought to mind that um, for years was really struggling in poverty. Native Washingtonian, just like me, you know, born and raised in DC, has lived in DC all her life, and for years she struggled in poverty. And, you know, it really came to a point where she really struggled to even find employment opportunities and realize that there was a gap in terms of the technical skills that she needed to be able to compete for those opportunities. And so she, you know, made a pivotal decision in her life, which was to really access training that was offered at Bite Back. And so she started off with Computer Foundations and sort of moved up. And um, today she is working a full-time job um, with full benefits. And she's working as an administrative assistant actually at Bite Back. And she continues to work with us because she understands and recognizes the importance of the work that we do and the importance of really imparting those uh, technical skills and being able to just get to a point where you're able to thrive in, you know, in our economy and be able to really rise out of poverty. And so I think that that um, really just kind of highlights um, the importance again of this work and being able to have access to technology and the skills needed to really be able to compete in the workplace. Absolutely. And do you have anything to add to that? 
Yeah, I just, um, I, I mean, I feel like I could tell like story after story of our participants and we don't have time for that. But, you know, I mean, in, in, in today's age, you know, you can't apply for a job at McDonald's or Target um, without, without using a computer. And they're not just an easy, you know, put in your name in your work history application. They're involved applications. But there's so much that people do. You know, you can't apply, um, or you can, but it's difficult to apply for unemployment without a computer. Um, and we um, have had so many people who've come in needing help with that. Um, there's a lot of courses that you can take online, applying for benefits, um, all sorts of things that we do. We don't even think about now, it's part of our life. And so if you don't have that access, ready access, um, it's really difficult. And especially at the beginning of the pandemic when everything was shut down, including the public libraries, people just didn't have anywhere they could go. I had this lovely woman standing outside the front of the workforce center with her laptop balanced on the, um, the railing because she could use our internet. And like, you know, this is, um, and she was trying to apply for jobs and like, you know, bless her, like she's still trying to apply for jobs even though there's this pandemic and everything shut down. But it just shows to me just how difficult it is if you don't have um, the, the access um, the skills and the, and the technology. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. Um, Nicole, this question's for you. How does DC's uh, digital divide compare to other cities and the nationwide problem overall? Yeah, I mean, if you don't mind, let me um, just kind of give some overview of the national perspective, because I think it's really relevant here. Um, first and foremost, we have to understand something. The digital divide was sort of conceived in the early 2000s around this concept, which was very binary, right? Who had access, who did not, who had a device, who did not, you know, who had digital literacy training, who did not. And I'm really encouraged by the young lady who spoke about getting skills around CompTIA because 20 years ago, I was actually working in spaces like that, which was around this constraint of this binary understanding of the digital divide. Now, we all fast forward 10, 15 years from now. I'm not going to tell my age, so I'm going to try to keep it really ambiguous, right? Yeah. But if we fast forward to where we are today with technology, here's the challenge. It's no longer about who has access, who doesn't. It's no longer about who has a device, who doesn't. It's about what we're hearing from everybody, in particular, um, Anna Maria, Melissa, that without access, you are actually outside of the norm of the types of uh, quality of life factors that you need to participate. Without a credit card, for example, you cannot get an Uber. Without you know, financial collateral, you are unable to get you know, rent an Airbnb. Uh, if you think about what has happened with school age kids, without a computer and a device, you cannot learn. And so if you begin to roll that over into adult literacy, for example, or adult training, the fact that we have the majority of black and brown people who are frontline workers, those that need the flexibility to work at home because now they also have to educate their children, they can't do that without internet. I just heard this anecdote in another location across the country where parents are using their kids' Chromebooks that are given from school just to get online at home to do the stuff they have to do for work. I mean, when I think about the digital divide, I actually think about this whole concept of digital justice and what Lindsay talked about in terms of what DC is trying to do. We have to break out of the mode of thinking that digital is seventh on the list. It is actually critical to every factor of society in ways that are just changing and transforming how we live, how we learn, how we earn, and how we engage in public discourse, particularly as we have an election coming up. I want to get off my soapbox now, but I think that's really important to say, because I think as we have this discussion, it becomes even more imperative that we think about how do we connect people so they can be included in the variety of verticals that help them to work, learn, live, get healthcare, and the variety of other functions that are now online. I, I'm shameless plug, I'm writing a book about this too on the US Digital Divide, and so I cannot help but think about all of the people across the country that I've spoken to, and I can't help to think about what the pandemic has done to actually make digital matter, because without connectivity, people can't even go to the doctor right now, right? Because of the fear and the risk of the spread in black and brown people. Black people now have COVID-19 as the third highest likelihood of death. So we need our communities connected so we can navigate through this time, this very serious time that unfortunately is going to continue to happen alongside the racial inequalities that we're actually seeing. So how does DC fare? I mean, DC is in the same boat as many other urban areas. Um, the challenge, and I think Lindsay pointed it out, of giving every household connectivity is, is a Herculean effort because we have a state within our cities and counties all over the country, whether rural or urban, uh, 18 million people generally not connected in this country before the pandemic, 
And that number is probably about 20 million now. And we could see them more because they were quite invisible, which is the title of my book, that we didn't know who they were until we had to actually rely upon digital to get things done. And so in the District of Columbia, we're seeing a lot of the same actions. How do we create uh, connectivity throughout the city? How do we drive it to the home so that we can get it for our school-aged children? How do we make sure that workers have access to technology and programs so they can be better integrated into this new normal? I would suggest to all of you that every city across the country is dealing with this right now. And thankfully, you have partners. Comcast Internet Essentials has been a great driver. 20 years ago, when I was working in DC doing digital activism, Comcast was there. And they continue to be there as one of the providers that are in your area. And we need to see, just like across the country, we're trying to get there, much like you know what DC is trying to do. No one, unfortunately, has figured out how to do full connectivity. Uh, it costs a lot in terms of the infrastructure, which is why you need other support. Even if you do the infrastructure, you don't always have the device. So kids, adults, grandparents cannot get online. And then you have the issue of literacy, which I would suggest is no longer about literacy, it's about privacy and people's understanding of how their data is being used to potentially discriminate against them. That's a whole nother panel. I'll come back, Elizabeth, for that one. <laughs> <laughs> she knows about that as my work at, uh, at Brookings is on algorithmic discrimination. And so I think going forward, we have to continue what we're doing the same way that I've been encouraging people across the country. I call Anna Maria and Melissa heroes and Elizabeth and other folks that are on this call because you're heroes trying to make sure people are actually connected to the lifeline that allows them to have a quality of life, particularly as adults who, like I said, if you think about where we're going in the digital ecosystem, digital technology makes about 6.2% of the GDP. You think about the fact that we're now dependent on online platforms and services, but guess what? We were kind of dependent on them before the pandemic. It's just even more important. If you look at communities, communities of color, we're seeing permanent closures of businesses. 100,000 small businesses across the country have closed as a result of this pandemic. Black and brown businesses are closing at rates of two to four when it comes to those that will be permanently shut. We now have vacant land, unused equipment that are sitting in offices because now we have remote workers. And we still have what Anna Marie and what Melissa have talked about, people who are in desperate need of services. And those services are not just about the technology, they're about the embeddedness of the technology and improving the quality of their households. And so I'm not trying to be pessimistic. It's morning, I don't wanna start nobody's day like this, I promise. <laughs> But I wanted to just share with you what we're going through in Washington, D.C. is the national emergency and crisis that we're going through throughout the country right now. Because we've not prioritized technology as one of the uh, le levers to actually help people succeed economically, socially, educationally. We've sort of seen it as this job that gets under-resourced, <laughs> people get underpaid because I've been there. But yet, this is probably the most critical moment and inflection point where people need to be connected. So I can come back and talk about more policy stuff and what we need to do, but I was charged to talk about that. So thank you for having me today. Yeah, you actually, um, I, I hadn't heard about um, the news that you know parents or just families were using the devices at home that were given to students, but it brought up something that I had been researching and just wanted to find data on. How are cities or, or offices even, even monitoring this? How are they finding those things out in one? And then two, if you see that these students actually need these devices, do they have to give them back at the end of the year? You know, more students are going to class, they're gonna need more devices. Like how, how is that stuff actually being monitored? Um, I, I wrote a story on the Bronx and just how minority communities there were even struggling to get access to those computers where all this funding was given to the education system to disperse these devices yet all of the a lot of just different school systems in the Bronx were actually struggling getting access to them so where are those devices being held lots of questions now you got my mind spinning yeah, <laughs> if I can jump in real quick I mean I got that story from a superintendent in Alabama gotcha. who was sharing and schools have had to become very permissive because they realize that all the attention and, and investments are going to school-age kids yeah. And they're not going to adults. <laughs> and adult learners have to keep up with the household. Absolutely. I don't know about many parents out there. My 13-year-old is upstairs right now, and I have no idea what she's doing, <laughs> right? Because I have to work while she's upstairs learning. And so I can imagine being in a space where I have to figure out how to navigate to get my clerical hours online or do certain things and still navigate and 
one statistic I want to keep with people. In low-income households, there was a statistic that was shared that less than 35% of households had more than one device but multiple siblings. And so this is becoming more complicated because the ecosystem has not figured out how to deal, I think, with the work of our partners on the call on this conference that we're doing to help adults find a space within the digital ecology. So, and that applies as well, I think, to educators. We also think that educators are connected. There are educators sitting in the parking lots of libraries and schools and Taco Bells to administer learning. And so I love the fact that you've gone to the Bronx. In my book, which comes out next spring, I went all across the country. And I'm from New York originally too, just talking to people about their digital access. And I'm going to tell you, it was really bad before the pandemic. <laughs> and it's going to get worse if we don't figure out how to make it an all hands on deck conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. That this, this, what we're talking about right now kind of leads into our next question. Um, and this is for everyone to talk about because I feel like you guys all would have different great perspectives. But what are the trends you're seeing and how people of color and black communities are affected by lack of digital equity and tech connections to work? So, so I'll jump in. Um, you know, I mean, I think I've, I've mentioned this, just the, the ability to take advantage of so many of these other things, the classes, the benefits, um, and I'll also echo Dr. Lee. I also just want to say to Dr. Lee, I don't think you need to tell people you're from New York when you get passionate. <laughs> it's very obvious. <laughs> um, but also, um, the, um, we are seeing that too, the parents using the, the children's devices. And, and you kind of understand if, if they need to have income to pay the rent or somebody needs to apply for unemployment so they can keep the lights on, of course the schooling is, is going to go to be the second priority and, and it's totally an understandable household decision. Um, I see so many people who come here at the Workforce Center who um, it, it, just their computer skills, you know, like um, opening up another tab on a browser, how do you do that? Um, I, I can't get into my Gmail. Somebody set it up. I have no idea what the password is. Just, I, I mean, again, I could go on and on. And so all of these things that there, it needs to be um, also a lot of, of skills. And honestly, it takes a patience that I, I wish I had. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to develop because um, you have to sit with people for a long time. So call out to everyone participating. I would love some virtual volunteers. Email me. I would love to help get, to get some more people doing that. But um, really sitting with people and going through exactly how they do everything um, so that they can then take advantage of all of these other options, the schooling, the, um, the job applications, all these things that are happening um, digitally, but like they, it's like a catch-22, like they don't have the skills so they can't even take advantage and then they get left further behind, right? Like the gap, we already have such a huge income gap in DC and it's just, it gets wider when there's less things you can take advantage of. I also um, really want to go to Dr. Lee's panel on algorithmic uh, discrimination because I know just like a teeny tiny bit about it and actually terrifies me just thinking about we already see so much non algorithmic that I don't uh, I'm, I'm really concerned about all of that that's probably like baked in that um, that we don't even realize is happening to the people that we're seeing. I wanted to share and tag on. Um, oh, go ahead, Melissa. Go ahead, Melissa. No, you're... go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say I, I love. I, I am so um, enthusiastically um, supportive of people who work in the digital inclusion space who take the time, like Amory said, to teach people technology skills. Like I said, when I was a graduate student in Chicago, I opened up a lot of computer labs, which is actually how I got into the digital device space. And it took a lot of patience, and I was so encouraged by Toilet's message around the certifications because back then we actually did the same thing and we tried to show people that it didn't matter where you came from that this grand certification of Microsoft Office at the time or CompTIA Security A plus actually was sort of your car your calling card to get into this general debate and I could not emphasize with all of you that as we move into a digital ecosystem this new set of jobs that are actually now showing up from all the work that we placed into our centers and the investments that people in our communities have made to our centers, it's actually gonna pay off. These are livable wage jobs. They are jobs that are gonna become more necessary. Think about all of the things that you now do online from shopping to educating yourselves to workforce development training. They're going to require more bandwidth, more wires, 
more pole attachments, uh, potentially 5G, to be able to generate the type of capacity. And they will be livable wage scale jobs for people in our communities who do not have to have a college degree, who do not have to have a PhD, who need a sense of understanding that it's not just about putting the pole up, but being the customer service agent. For entrepreneurs in DC, the opportunity to come up with the next app that helps people affected by COVID deal with chronic illness and disease. I just saw, for example, an app on Good Morning America where they, some company has built this um, application that can detect the number of coughs and sneezes in a classroom to be able and, and do a thermal scan of whether or not a child has a fever. I just say that as we have this conversation, that this opportunity and this fourth industrial revolution are gonna be huge. And it's going to be up to the local advocates and trainers and partnering with the city to make sure the residents of DC are ready for these new opportunities. Yeah, the, the, only, um, the only thing that I'll kind of sort of add to this discussion is really, um, you know, and it, it's sort of like a thread of everything that we've kind of heard um, the other panelists kind of mention is, you know, the role that, you know, systemic racism has played in really keeping black and brown people um, really sort of outside of all of these technological advancements and being able to compete in the, in the marketplace. And, you know, just the sheer volume of the fact that 95% of our students are persons of color, I think really highlights, um, you know, the major gap that exists. And when we talk about like tech spaces, for example, and the opportunities within technological or tech um, companies, for example, there isn't a lot of diversity and we, we know this, right? Like, I've gone to multiple conferences and heard multiple speakers talk about this, but we really do need um, there to be more diversity prioritized in tech spaces. And, you know, I look at our students every, well, virtually in the, now, um, but it's still every day, right? And they are motivated. Um, they're excited about, you know, gaining these new skills. They're excited about what the opportunities are at the completion of training when they go into employment and they're able to, as I mentioned before, like our alum who was able to really change the course of her life and her family's life just by being able to access a job with well-paying benefits and be able to have a career. So um, I think, again, this is, you know, this conversation and the work that we're doing is incredibly important to sort of move the needle on that. Absolutely. All right. So now we have some understanding of the digital divide in DC. Now the question is, what do we do about it? Melissa, I'm going to bounce back to you. What would it look like to close the digital skills gap in DC? And what would Bite Back need to help make it happen? Absolutely. Um, you know, in the summer, the DC City Council, as well as the mayor, had an opportunity to really prioritize uh, digital inclusion and equity in the budget. Um, I think that it's incredibly important that for the next budget that that is prioritized, that more investments are made um, in, you know, from DC government across multiple agencies um, like OCTO, like DOES, to really prioritize opportunities for individuals um, in DC, DC residents to be able to access skills training. Um, you know, I want to highlight, you know, wards six, seven, and eight in particular, um, where oftentimes there's um, communities of individuals who really are um, needing those skills and really needing to find, you know, um, essentially work that really helps them be able to earn a living wage. Um, I think it's really important that, um, you know, that we just really uh, prioritize, you know, those investments. And I also think that you know, uh, startups as well as corporate um, um, companies within within this the, within this space really also kind of join in and really help to support um, this incredible work. I love that. I'm actually going to do a follow up question from um, from someone in the crowd, Dahlia. Sorry if I didn't say your name right, but this is for you, Melissa. I think it's these are some good follow up questions to what you just said. Um, they want to know what what are the reasons why the council and mayor did not include this in the budget, and what are the challenges we can slash should address to make dif differences next vote, to make a difference next vote. Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know this really hasn't necessarily been as much of a priority, and I think that this is something that has been kind of 
Um, I think Dr. Uh, Nicole Turner Lee also mentioned it. It hasn't really been something that has been prioritized. Um, and so I think that, you know, there's certainly an opportunity for that um, to happen. Um, I don't know if, you know, there's any other reasons really quite honestly, other than the fact that it just wasn't necessarily a priority. And then there were other things that were much more, um, you know, that, the, that they were just much more focused on. Got it, thank you. All right, Anne-Marie, this question's for you. What would it look like to have all adults in DC have the skills they need for today's jobs? What would Skyland and BBAR need to help make it happen? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we would need a lot of, of people, a lot of programs willing to, like I said, to sit with people and really, um, there are classes, but also really patiently one-on-one -on -one and just teach a lot of these skills. Um, one of the things we have a lot of returning citizens that come to the workforce center and they obviously haven't had access to computers or full access to computers um, while in prison. And so they're at, at a really um, an extra disadvantage in terms of having to use this technology now to apply for a job that they didn't have to use before they went away. And so just having um, enough people to, to teach, those, teach those skills um, and really show people exactly how to use the computers and then I think, again, the, the access, um, I think it would be great for everyone to have a computer and technology at home, but also having places like our lab here at Skyland, libraries, other places where people can go access the computer and a computer with, that has a staff where someone can help someone if they get stuck um, to move to that next stage, I think would make a really big difference. Absolutely. Nicole, looking at the big picture, from your extensive research, what do you think DC needs to do to catch up? What, what would it take to say this community has achieved digital equity? Whew, that's, that's what everybody's been asking me, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dahlia put out a question in the chat too about Brookings. Of course, we would love to support. It's, it's so interesting. Um, I'm not going to say that my life wasn't busy because it was busy before the pandemic, but it's even more busy. And what's so great about it is the conviction that I have to ensure that our communities receive some light type of equity is really important to me. So we'd love to keep talking to the city of DC on what could be done because I think we also need case studies so that we could actually see what best practices are working. So what do we need to do to close the digital divide? Let me just talk about it nationally and then I'm gonna talk about DC. I think nationally, one thing that we have to definitely do is we have to make a social contract with the federal government that this is important. I mean, it is very shameful that we have had to wait for a variety of iterations of stimulus support to give teachers money that they needed to get Wi-Fi hotspots or the city of DC what they needed to get homes connected. That was just shameful and an abject failure on our part to recognize that our inability to connect our communities, black and brown communities, has implications for not just achievement, but also for opportunities. And the more that we sort of hit it, you know, go around the edges of the fact that we need to solve this national crisis of a digital divide, I don't know what to tell us. Our universal service reform system in this country is just not designed to be able to bring the type of relief, much like we do with food insecurity. We have SNAP, we have TANF, we have nothing that actually gives people who need broadband immediate emergency relief, much like we need in this pandemic. And the hope is we have programs like the Lifeline program, which provides a small subsidy for people to get online, but it's not enough. In my travels around the country, people have Lifeline, they have a set amount of minutes, and unfortunately, if you're a day laborer and your minutes run out, you can't find work for the rest of the month. And that's something that we have to address as a country because we're essentially creating a digitally invisible population that will come back and they will need to be prepared to work in these new opportunities because who else is going to? And that's the challenge that we have in black and brown communities. At a city level, I think it's important what we heard Lindsay talk about for cities to have a clear message on how they're going to integrate digital into every facet of city life. So we've all, traditionally, when I've been working in the space over the last 20 years, we've always had digital inclusion plans. And I think those are actually really important because they are a blueprint for how connected, how smart we want our cities to be. I'm going to actually impress upon cities to go a little deeper. Let's start talking about the integration of broadband. So when somebody talks about, well, is it in the budget? It needs to be. It needs to be part of our social services delivery systems. It needs to be part of our housing system. There should be no housing in the District of Columbia that is not built with some type of connectivity attached to it. I know we might want to do business with a certain provider. I think that's fine. The key thing is we should have housing having its own open network so people can actually get technology access, perhaps from the lobby, 
the front step. We're going to make them go to the front stoop in, of a school or go to Taco Bell to learn. We might as well let them do it in their own neighborhood. Um, and so I think we need to look at cities really pushing the envelope to bring connectivity to the local level. Same thing when it comes to adult learners. When the centers are not open and they're waiting for you to open, this is what my experience, and I'm sure the ladies have the same experience, standing at the door, can't wait till you open up. We should be taking these digital parking lots and making them into digital parks. Let's put some benches and repurpose open spaces. DC has done a fantastic job of repurposing open spaces for tourism. Let's repurpose open spaces in black and brown communities so we ensure that people can get access from these public areas in which they may have to sit with their child and do homework, or they may have to teach a class, or they may need to get online and do some administrative work. We need to look and push the envelope on that. And then going back to a local level, I think the city needs to do an inventory of all the unused office spaces that are gonna be opened up around the district, particularly in areas where black and brown people live. I keep having these nightmares that two things are gonna happen in the next year, that we're gonna go back to not just broadband deserts as they currently exist, but community deserts where the vitality of local businesses will not be there because they have been pretty much obliterated because of this pandemic. I think it's a great idea for us to start thinking about what Aaron Sanders did with N3DC, to put incubators there, to partner with workforce development agencies, create small spaces for congregations around different work skills. The challenge that we're gonna have is that people still need to be safe from this pandemic, particularly black and brown people, but perhaps we could find different pods where we can bring people together in person. I was wanna give the audience a quick statistic on how this is playing out in learning. Black kids that do not go back to formal education in the next few months will be 10.3 months behind in cognitive retention or learning, which means they will not catch up to their peers in private and charter schools when it comes to the retention of basic concepts. For K through six, that is going to be critical. For the child that is upstairs, probably laying on her floor right now while I'm down here, that's gonna be even more critical because she's gonna start engaging in standardized testing that will make determinations on her college achievement. And so I just say to all of you, we need a strategy that involves how do we get access to communities in creative ways that may not look as familiar. I've been telling libraries across the country, why don't you just go back to when I was a little kid that used to have the mobile book bank, showed up in my neighborhood, it was like the ice cream truck, start beeping, why can't we put Wi-Fi enablers on top of mobile book banks and bring it out to communities in Anacostia Southeast where people can actually file for unemployment benefits because there's connectivity that actually exists within their neighborhood. I, I guess I'm trying to be really radical in thinking because I see cities across the country struggling to figure out what's the right post-it note to ensure that we get everybody connected, access to food, access to social services, access to healthcare, and we're not leveraging technology in the way that we should, which is contextualizing it and couching it in the way that we do stuff. It is time to append the delivery of services and modernize them so that we can give more support to the tech centers and agencies and individual champions that are trying to get more people connected. And so I would just say, you know, going forward, we've got to put a push on federal support. You've got to keep private sector partnerships in line and you've got to think creatively and out the box. We will not see a society that looks the same. I, I feel for the two ladies, because I remember sitting in my computer labs and people write, I'm over people's shoulder, trying to see if they push the right button. That doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> I met this lady who has a computer lab. She said she literally has to stand eight, what was it with y'all? Eight feet away, right? Mm -hmm. I was just amazed by that because that's gonna change the nature in which we teach people. And so I think going forward, we just need the district maybe to come up with an office. Lindsay, this is an idea, an office of innovation that is around just these issues of how the city innovates along all of its verticals to ensure that digital is not an afterthought, but it's actually integrated into everything that you do. Absolutely. Um, you kind of brought up a point. You're like, why can't we just have internet access anywhere? There's actually a question in the chat about mesh networks. Um, for anyone who doesn't know out there, mesh networks are groups of devices that act as single Wi-Fi networks, but essentially spanning the connection um, to a wider range of people. Um, do any of the panelists um, know anything about mesh networks in DC? I myself haven't heard of one. Yeah, um, no, no, there, there's been some examples. So for the person in Tacoma Park, I mean, they've done community yeah, okay. mesh networks. I think Octo actually has been very supportive of local networks. I mean, for the people in Baltimore, I read the question. I think it's a great yeah. idea. The challenge that you're going to run into is the assets that you can get hold of. Can you get hold of city assets? 
what poles are around you, what facilities are close by, how do you still pay for it? You know, the key thing is what I would suggest first in Baltimore is go to some local partners and say, okay, what can we do to, what can I do to build this? I love though the idea of engaging young people, which is another thing I think the DC, the district can do. I think Comcast has already done this with the digital connectors, but getting young people motivated and activated around these hands-on skills. So I do think in Baltimore, you can do a mesh network. And I've been talking to a lot of schools that are trying to do a mesh network, but some of them do run up against um, a barrier. What I would love to do is I just did a talk for the state of Texas, and there was a really great example of a project of a mesh network around a school area and workforce development agency that was successful. So I will put my uh, email in the chat. And uh, if you get back in touch with me, uh, that would be great. Or send me your email through question and answers, and then I can actually get follow up with you. Awesome. I have an accessibility question. Maybe Anne-Marie, you can answer this. Um, Someone wants to, well, Dahlia wants to know, she's been asking some, some great questions. Um, please talk about accessibility for people with disabilities who may have limited training on tech. Also the lack of accessibility is yet another barrier to engaging in the digital universe. Um, are there more resources being provided um, for accessibility? I know this is something I focused a lot on last year and just trying to see what DC is actually doing to, to give more digital access to people who may not easily um, be able to get it. Yeah, I wish I knew the answer to that, honestly. Um, I mean, we that's not something that we have here. And I mean, that's just like, another, I think that's probably for a lot of people, another barrier is if there's um, issues where they can't just sit down at a computer um, like we can in our lab, like how are they getting to access the technology? Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Anyone else have any, any um, insights on accessibility? I think accessibility is really important. I think for older Americans in particular, you need accessibility tools. Um, what we are finding is that accessibility in the previous life of technology were bigger screens, uh, better, uh, more agile and mobile uh, mouse pads, keyboards, et cetera. One of the things that we now have seen technology develop are these natural language processing devices like the Alexa, which allow people to actually speak in their concerns. AARP has a really interesting model where they gave low-income people um, in D.C. housing, as well as folks in Baltimore uh, and Alexa. Uh, people have been chatting around this algorithmic discrimination. I'll just give a real quick example that's related to answering this question. Um, in the D.C. area, they actually found that the seniors were frustrated because the Alexa could not understand their, uh, their um, I want to say Ebonics, but their quickness in speaking into it. So oh, they, wow. they were not, not going to use it. And Baltimore, it was an Eastern European population who decided they weren't going to use it because the Alexa kept mis improperly translating them. That is sort of at the root of algorithmic bias because these systems were never tested on cultural populations. That and as a result, the training data did not recognize their voice well enough to assist them as seniors to get more connected to technology. So yeah, so we're seeing those devices actually used in ways to help with the accessibility challenges. But once we get the connectivity right, I believe seniors will be huge beneficiaries of this new technology, particularly for those that want to age in place. Yeah, I think that's just a funny tidbit. I always play with my phone when I'm talking to Siri. Um, my name is Michelle. I will say Siri, say Michelle. She does not say Michelle. And I'm like, I don't know about this Apple. <laughs> like that is not my name. I don't know what she just said. But yeah, that that's a good example. That's algorithmic discrimination where we have a couple of things where the technology is not built by people of color, so it doesn't really yeah. reflect the lived experiences. And then the data that it's trained on doesn't include us. So things like natural language processing, facial recognition are all inadequately suited to help us. Or we give so much data that the technology recognizes the external legacies of discrimination and racism that it profiles us and it surveils us. Uh, and so we don't get insurance, so we don't get access to programs because technology has basically kicked us out based on its perceptions of our collective um, experiences. All right, um, another point slash question from Dahlia. Like Finland, she would like to see DC as Wi-Fi covered in its entirety in all public spaces. What about the idea of making internet a utility? Would this require federal action or could we start at the city and state level? I've never even thought of that. That is a great idea. I mean, well, 
I'm sorry. I, I'm a policy person, and I'll be quiet for the rest yeah. of the I promise. I feel like that kid in the <laughs> head, just be quiet, girl. Um, but this is the thing. I, I think people are, have, are on the right track around broadband as a public utility because we're actually finding that the social contract of everybody needing access is really important. But I also think that people have to recognize the reason that we're where we are is because of private sector investment. Broadband is one of those spaces that has not necessarily been regulated by the government, nor has it received resources from the government to build out, except in these small pockets of universal service money that comes for individuals who can't afford broadband, as I mentioned earlier, or for rural broadband, where we have a greater problem of people who are not connected, who are also black and brown people. And so what does that mean going forward? You know, it's one of those models where I think we need to revisit what does universal service look like in this country and how ubiquitous do we want broadband? I think we need to think of this public utility debate in, with some reservation, however, because if you look at rural electrification or you look at your water or heating bill, rate regulation can in some cases inflate your costs. And in many respects, you could find yourself paying for your neighbor who takes up more broadband than you do, which is something that we in Washington have to continue to debate. Like how do you make this ubiquitous while at the same time not imposing costs that may be fair but may have some restrictions if the government were to run our broadband services on what low-income people could actually consume. I always get nervous when I first thought about this years ago, I was a huge fan of public utility, rural electrification, and then I saw Flint and what they did with the water system. And I said to myself, you know, do I want government to be managed by broadband? Do I want this on a government network where they could see what I'm doing? And I think at the end of the day, we're gonna have to come to the table and we're at the point of an election, which is why voting matters where this could potentially become an, a question of how do we maybe do better partnerships between the companies that build them and government that wants to make pe sure people are online? How do we actually make it so that in areas where we don't have enough competition or we don't have enough access that we actually create drivers to do so? Um, in my book, I'm toying around with a couple of those ideas, but I think across the country, everyone is sort of scratching their head and asking why. And I, I really want people to be clear in the United States, we gave up our right to pay for the internet to, or not to pay for the internet, excuse me, pay for platforms, which is also what people also confuse because of the way we structured it governmentally. And so I think we have to kind of have a conversation on what does universal service look like in this country? How important is it to be like European countries where in my travels across uh, the country overseas uh, for the last few years, their internet is also not that great um, mm -hmm. in terms of quality where we might have better quality. I think those are the questions that we need to be asking of the administration. I think for city leaders, you need to be asking yourself the same question. It's got to go back to what Lindsay said. Cities do not have enough money to connect everybody. So they need philanthropy. They need partners in the business community. They need to redirect social service money. And perhaps we need to just have a big all hands on, scratch our head, and let's figure out what will it take to create the social contract that is necessary to still provide people with high quality broadband. Absolutely. I just want to mishlate some idea that I have sort of been toying around with in my head is, you know, I think about the first source law, right, and how we have the expectation that, you know, companies that, for example, do business in D.C., they have to hire a certain number of D.C. residents. And I kind of really have this sort of vision and idea that for, you know, the Comcast and, you know, the Verizons, right, of the world, that if they want to be able to offer that service, they have to also come with some sort of investment in making sure that there is access, you know, and connectivity to the residents within, you know, that city or within that state. And so that's just sort of like an idea that I've, I've sort of thought about, um, just kind of making sure that there is also, I mean, obviously there is a responsibility for government here but certainly for the corporations to be able to also be invested in the communities that they also want to do business in. Absolutely. Um, another question. Sorry, Anne, did you want to? Oh, yeah, no, I was just going to add, um, I just want to say I'm so thankful for to Dr. Lee for thinking about these things broadly, because I'm really like working in such a one on one space. But it also occurs to me in terms of this question of how we do it, that at the very least, all public housing and any housing that's affordable, so getting any city or federal subsidy, and that should be a requirement that internet is provided to all the residents. I feel like that should be a piece, just like, like she said, like water and heat and electricity are provided, that should be something that's provided. And I think that would go a long way to helping at least the folks who are um, in subsidized or city-run housing are getting access. 
Yeah, if I could actually jump into that, I think that's that's an excellent idea. It's an idea that I've worked on for about 25 years here in the district as well. Any new affordable housing that comes in the city must be connected. And that could be a quick resolution to ensure this broadband connectivity. If it can't be connected directly to the home because of you know laws that may have been on the books or statutes, it needs to have some kind of activity on the margins where people live. I think having that design standard is the first thing. But I also wanna say, and I'm looking at the chat that somebody put in that I thought was very interesting, which I uh, did not say, and I wanna say this, at the crux of all of this is the importance of data collection. In many respects, we really don't know across the country where we have a lot of broadband and where we don't have enough. We don't know, for example, in housing, Anne-Marie, right, you probably attested this, where people don't have broadband in Section 8 housing or scattered site housing. And so I think getting a data repository, working with local groups to be able to ask that question, it took us 10 years in some programs um, when I was working in to actually ask people if they had broadband at all. Did you know schools don't even ask kids and households if they have broadband access when they're registering them or re-enrolling them? They ask so them I think, now. Yeah, exactly. But they, <laughs> home and they like, have to, well, right? What are you going to do now? It's like they're already at home. <laughs> it's crazy. Like when everything shut down, I found out across the country, schools just didn't even know. They didn't even know who their provider was, right. you know? And so I agree with everybody that I think that there should be certain places within cities where it should be resolute homeless shelters. You know, every place around a homeless shelter or within a homeless shelter should be connected. In fact, I wrote this blog because of the unsafe nature of homeless shelters and the security of sometimes children in doing work or adults working. There should be some adjacent partnerships or property where people could actually go to a digital park, like I said, an unused office space so that kids can learn and, and actually engage. But we don't even connect the shelters. Um, and there have been some places across the country that are bringing up those school buses with Wi-Fi enabled service just so people within a, uh, transitional housing can get access to do certain things. So there's a lot that we could actually be doing. And um, you know, I hope to write more about this. Absolutely. We're actually running out of time. I love that the chat is, is buzzing right now. We actually have a lot of questions. Um, I took some down. I know um, Bite Back is behind the scenes grabbing those to pull a blog post together with some answers. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for joining today. Um, I'm actually going to wrap this up and um, push it back to Yvette, who's also going to do some calls to action, share some resources, and introduce the next panel. Thank, thank you, you Michelle. Yes, thank, thank you, Melissa, Nicole, and Marie. Thank you, all um, for this panel. I feel like I have a lot of work to do after this. I know, right? Well, I'm just, just like, my head is like, <laughs> <laughs> And it's just the morning. <laughs> Thank you for being a great moderator. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you all. I don't usually think this hard before 11 a.m. Um, so it's, it's really great work that's happening in D.C. and nationally. Um, I hope that that first panel sparked some ideas in you and how you can make a difference with digital justice, a new term from Dr. Nicole Turner Lee. I know I have tons of ideas coming from it. And we will be sharing this recording if you missed something uh, to folks who signed up and also on our blog at fightback.org. Um, so again, I'm one of your hosts today. I'm Yvette Spores, the communications director at Fightback. We have another amazing panel coming up. Um, before we head into that second panel, we have uh, another poll for you guys. Um, and I believe Margo's going to queue that up for us. Um, and while that's happening, there it goes. Um, kind of a survey of how you think um, internet devices and skills training, how should they be provided for people in DC? Um, and while you are answering, um, I also want you to see our chat for links, like our panelists mentioned. Uh, digital inclusion requires investment and commitment from all of us, from our elected officials, government agencies, nonprofits, um, our employers, our uh, activists and residents. And we have some resources for you to help residents get connected, get devices, and get training. Uh, we want you to sign up to stay involved in the digital equity movement. We have a Google form there if you'd like to stay with us, and especially into spring, to get some movement behind this. Uh, you can connect with Fightback on our new website at fightback.org and continue to share your thoughts on Twitter. 
we're getting some uh, nice tweets out there. So I really appreciate having other folks to talk to on Twitter, hashtag digital equity DC. Um, and um, there's a couple more links here for Capital Clubhouse. There's resources. Um, and you can also go to the landing page, um, cnhed.org. Uh, so we have our panel back. Apparently, um, none of you think that <laughs> internet devices and skills training should have to be um, completely at a fee for participants and for users. Um, so that's great, and a lot of you support free for low-income residents or even free service for all. So really interesting results. Thank you for participating in that. Um, and we're ready to move into our second and final panel. I have the great and probably once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to introduce another Yvette. This has never happened in my life. Uh, you met her earlier. Yvette Banfield is the VP of Economic Development Policy at CNHED, and she leads the Workforce Development Working Group. Right back as a member, and we encourage you to join that group and the coalition. They've been amazing. And Yvette shows a deep commitment to DC and to an inclusive economic development agenda through coalition building, policy, and advocacy. Um, you saw her this morning, and I've had the great experience of working with her to plan this event today. She deserves a huge thank you. I don't think you have those little clappy things in your Zoom, but give her a shout out in the in the chat. Um, I know you're all on mute, but I'm imagining your applause. Um, and also, special shout out to everyone who helped organize again today. Uh, Yvette will be moderating the panel and closing out the morning. The second panel is Investing in Digital Inclusion for DC's Future, How Black and Brown DC Residents, Businesses, and the Economy Will Benefit. Yvette, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Yvette. <laughs> um, it has been a pleasure working with you as well. And uh, um, I wanna thank the, the first panelists. Um, what an excellent um, uh, way to kick off uh, this conversation. Um, you um, helped to kind of segue us into our next panel. Um, and so the panelists will make themselves unmute themselves and as I introduce you and introduce the topic. So the second panel is uh, focused on investing in digital inclusion for DC's future, how black and brown residents, businesses and the economy will benefit. So as the pandemic has eroded employment gains and the economy grows more dependent on digitally trained workforce, who's being left behind? And we heard about some of this, um, who's being left behind in the first panel. Half of DC, uh, half of black workers and more than half of Latino X, Latinx workers in the US need digital skills. The consequences for this digital divide in DC are huge, amplifying racial inequities while also further, further da um, damaging the economy. Investing in digital inclusion, access to devices, internet and um, tech training, computer training will help DC's economy, um, will help DC's economic viability post COVID. And, but it will also help black and brown residents build the wealth that they deserve. We're delighted to have this esteemed panel with us to engage us in a thoughtful conversation to close out today's event. Joining us are Alina Stern, who is the Data Science Fellow at Urban Institute, Amanda Berkson Shilcock, with um, she's also the fellow, senior fellow at National Skills Coalition. Joining us also is Raymond Bell, who's the CEO of Hope Project. And last but not least is Stephen Harrington. He is the manager of engagement and external affairs at the Greater Washington Partnership. We're delighted to have them um, with us today and we're going to kick off our um, panel with them introducing themselves, their organization, yep, their role, but we, we're asking them also to share with the audience how they also define digital inclusion. Alina, you want to go first? Oh, I am sorry. I'm happy to. I'm having some trouble trying my video. Oh, hold up, let me see. Um, start my video. 
Great. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me, and thanks, Yvette, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I, you know, when I think about digital inclusion um, and digital equity, I, of course, think about the you know, three-legged stool of inclusion, about equitable access to connectivity, to connected devices, as well as digital literacy, but then also taking a broader aperture to think about digital equity and the ability to sort of use those skills and those devices to fully participate and engage in the economy, civic discourse, and in society more broadly. Amanda? Oh, we can't hear you. So well, I'm sorry about that. I, I double muted myself. Excuse <laughs> me. Um, thanks, Yvette. It's great to be here, and what a terrific first panel that was. Um, so I work for National Skills Coalition. We are a nonprofit policy advocacy organization that focuses on state and federal policy. And when I think about digital inclusion, I think about absolutely the three legs of the digital inclusion stool that we've all been working uh, and talking about. Um, how do we make sure that we don't have multiple family members all trying to depend on one device? How do we make sure that people aren't needing to go and sit in a Taco Bell parking lot to get Wi-Fi to do their homework? Um, how do we make sure that people feel confident in navigating digital tools? But I also think about recognizing people's expertise. We spend a lot of time in digital inclusion conversations talking about deficits, all the things people don't have. And I think it's important to acknowledge the deficits and the structural reasons for those deficits that are not about individual people's failings. But I think it's also really important to acknowledge that people are incredibly ingenious and people are consistently creating and innovating using technological tools even when they're not operating under the best of circumstances. And so for me, digital inclusion also means having a way to recognize the expertise that people bring to the table, even when that isn't something that um, people sort of default to understanding. And the quick example I'll give here is around um, a lot of uh, immigrant um, leaders use free conference call services to run radio stations. Right, And so we may not think of somebody sitting with a laptop at a kitchen table in a small apartment as being a radio host, but in fact, that is what's happening in many cases, right? And it's not limited to immigrants, but it's common among immigrant communities because of language issues. Um, so there's a million examples like that of the ingenious ways that African-American workers of color, um, U.S. born and foreign born folks are doing creative things with technology. And I think when we think about digital inclusion, yes, we absolutely need to acknowledge the deficits and the ways that those deficits need to be addressed by policy, but we also need to recognize the expertise that folks bring to the table. Thank you. Um, Raymond. I'm the founder and the administrator of Hope Project. And in 2009, I kind of went on a personal campaign to try to end poverty in D.C. And since then, I've trained, coached, and you know, still mentor to this day almost 2,000 graduates that work on almost every major government contract in the Washington metropolitan area. I'm talking about all the big companies, the Lockheed Martins, the Northrop Grumman's, the CACI's, all the big nonprofits, Planned Parenthood, World Bank. All the big law firms down, downtown. We even have people um, stationed over in Afghanistan pulling in $237,000 a year. So shout out to uh, Thaddeus for making that move uh, for himself and his family. And he's also starting to recruit other people to do the same thing. So the one thing that I really want to focus on when we start talking about like digital inclusion, most people know me as this one trick pony. I'm this single issue guy. I care about jobs, careers, and entrepreneurship. So almost all of my conversation today is going to lead back to jobs, careers, entrepreneurship, because my goal in this community is try to help end poverty. And we figured out a blueprint to doing that through this, um, this very unique training program um, called Whole Project. And then just one quick example of 
um, like digital inclusion. So for example, we, we know some uh, six months to a year ago, we were really active in DC trying to recruit um, Amazon to DC. Um, although they didn't wind up landing in the city, they're still local. So all the folks in the DMV can benefit from them being there, either working for them or working for some of their partners. My job and our job in an organization like this and in a platform like this is to constantly be advocating for more IT training, more IT opportunities, because I always feel like we're like the, the ugly stepchild. Everybody else gets love um, in the city when it comes to various occupations, and they're all great from hospitality to construction and all the others, but I'm so happy to have this platform today to talk about how we can help more people uh, build careers in IT, uh, get, gain certifications, and then we can really close the, the digital divide because when Amazon showed up, I was excited to have them come, but I didn't personally think we were ready as a city to help um, the, um, the hardest to serve people take advantage of a big organization like that coming to town. But I'm excited about some of the things I'm hearing. We started to build our own relationship with Amazon and their, um, their training teams and stuff like that. So I'm excited to be here. I'm looking forward to sharing the, my last 12 <laughs> to 15 years of expertise around IT and technology. Great, thank you, Raymond. And Stephen. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Harrington, Director of Engagement and External Affairs at the Greater Washington Partnership. For those of you who may not know, the partnership is a civic alliance of CEOs and other entrepreneurs uh, representing the capital region. We define the region as from Richmond to Baltimore. It's a little bit wider uh, than typically defined uh, to date. Uh, in terms of what we think of in terms of digital uh, inclusion, we see it as a game changer uh, for the region. Uh, Raymond talked about Amazon. I'm sure we're going to talk about a little bit more about that later on today. How do we make sure that p individuals across the region, regardless of race, ethnicity, geographic location, have access to those jobs uh, that Amazon is bringing to 125 uh, and, and more uh, income brackets? And how do we make sure that school systems and others across the region have access to the tools that they need in order so that uh, children and students that are coming up have the opportunities to do and create the great things uh, that Amanda was talking about earlier. So really looking forward to uh, engaging in this discussion and just providing more about the business and employer lens. So uh, thank you, Yvette. Well, thank you. So let's unpack this a little bit more. Um, from your vantage point, each of you, can you talk about, talk a little bit about how the digital divide is both a local and a regional issue? Whoever wants to kick it off, um, you can start. Oh, I'm, well, I'm happy to go first. So it, it is local. It's actually global. I remember in the ninth grade, my <laughs> English teacher told me, Raymond, you're going to grow up in a global economy. So it really is global. We can definitely just focus on local and regional. And, and, a, and a good example for me on, on a career and a job side is we have recruiters that are now reaching out to us primarily because of the pandemic, we all are starting to work remotely. So now I'm getting calls from um, tech systems, Randstad, and a bunch of other recruiters and staff and agencies trying to re recruit people in Norfolk and Richmond. Why is that? Because they're gonna allow people to work remotely. There was a time when if you're gonna work down there, you would literally be packing up and leaving DC area and going down there. I have students now literally are taking their $85,000 jobs that have become 100% remote because people have become comfortable with paying somebody $85,000 and not seeing them in person anymore. And they're moving to, to the South. They're one of the students going to Greensboro, North Carolina. He's just gonna pack up and go back down there because that's where he went to college, but he's gonna maintain his job here in DC. And we all know that you can probably live pretty good on $85,000 in Greensboro versus up here, you're still in a one bedroom apartment and probably can't afford a car and insurance. That's, that's just a good example of the, the regional and, and locally when it comes to, to, to digi digital divide and digital inclusion, having people have access to do things outside of a, a, a physical location anymore. And I'm going to constantly champion that because when the pandemic hit, my 2000 graduates, not a single one of them lost their job. Not a lot of programs or a lot of, a lot of people can say that they have help 2,000 people gain employment in a particular industry and due, due to the pandemic, no one lost their job. As a matter of fact, uh, the graduates are getting constantly um, bombarded by recruiters asking for um, resumes to take you know, on other, other positions. And they're excited because 
the demand is so high, they're able to negotiate much higher salaries. And remember, for me, it's all about jobs, careers, and entrepreneurship. I'm happy to chime in next from a very different perspective as Raymond. Uh, a lot of my research focuses on how cities are using technology both to address and narrow the digital divide as well as how city use of technology that doesn't center equity can actually exacerbate divides because of the digital divide. And I think we see that there's a lot that cities can do and are doing to narrow the divide. Um, we you know, on the last panel, we're talking about sort of innovative public-private partnerships, and especially during the pandemic, we've seen cities really accelerating efforts by working with private entities to distribute uh, laptops and connected devices and hotspots to close the digital divide, as well as providing free broadband internet access. But when we think about moving from some of these short-term, you know, solutions to more long-term solutions, that's really where sort of the regional, state, and national focus has to be part of the conversation as well. And we see in a lot of cases that the sort of policy options available to cities are constrained by state and federal policy. Um, one example of this is 2018 FTC regulations that limited these that cities could charge on 5G small cell deployments, which in many the key revenue source for funding digital inclusion efforts. And so you know, needing to create more revenue to do all this great work we're talking about will require policy action at the federal level. And um, a number of states, including Virginia, we're talking regionally in region, sort of ban or restrict municipalities from launching or expanding their own public broadband networks, um, which you know was talked about on the last panel. Uh, for example, in Virginia, municipalities can not provide services that are at rates lower to what the private incumbents will provide. And so that, you know, takes away tools that could be in the toolkit for cities to lose, lower the gap of uh, the digital divide. So I think when we think about solutions and sort of providing long-term uh, changes to close the digital divide, we need to think both at a local level, but also a regional, state, and even federal level as well. Amanda. Yeah, so people live in physical places, but as we know really well in the DC area, people also live their lives across political boundaries, right? So you might live in one state, work in another, you might have your kids attending uh, school in a municipality different from the one in which you live. So we know already that people live their lives in ways that are not completely circumscribed by political boundaries, but we haven't had our digital policymaking catch up with that reality, right? Um, I was part of a great discussion a couple of weeks ago in which folks were talking about career and technical education without borders. The idea that really high quality career in tech ed is often uh, housed in a school district or at a community college, but now that we're in this pandemic affected world where a lot of that education has moved online, how might we open that up to folks who live outside the geographic catchment area that might previously have had access to that kind of high quality career and technical education. That's just one example. So when I think about this, I think about this as being a local issue because nothing will ever matter more to an elected official than their home district and their constituents, but also a regional issue because people live their lives and interact socially, politically, um, uh, vocationally, and otherwise across uh, both municipal boundaries and state boundaries. So when we think about good policy, we want there to be good policy coming down from the federal level with enough investment that local and regional areas can, can sort of incorporate the flexibility they need to to support workers. I thought Raymond's point was really important, right? We have all these folks now who are newly flexible in their jobs and they're choosing where they're going to live. And so they might be bringing their expertise back to a community that perhaps they grew up in but haven't been able to live in previously. Maybe they went away for an education. So how do we tap into that? How do we, in the best possible sense of the word, kind of um, add momentum uh, and, and really um, you know, exploit not in the negative sense, but in the positive sense, the expertise that people are bringing and the um, energy and initiative and, and frankly, um, the ability to think across 
um, industries and across occupations, right? Somebody might have expertise in working in IT in the financial sector or in, um, you know, the healthcare sector, and then they move back to a community, they're working remotely, but they become a resource person for other people in that community who might want to move into that field. We often hear the saying, you can't be what you can't see, right? When people move into a community um, where perhaps there have been fewer folks who followed that career path and they become what in the wonderful words of Janet Mock is called a possibility model, right? Not a role model, but a possibility model. This is a possibility for what your adult life could look like. That's incredibly valuable in terms of helping folks think about paths towards occupational digital literacy and careers that really allow them to earn family sustaining wages. So when I think about digital inclusion policy being both a local and a regional issue, those are some of the issues that come to mind for me. Excellent, I, I like that. Um, possible, the possibility model, I like that. And also the mm -hmm. idea that it's, it is the fluidity, um, just because someone, we focus so much that we wanna retain people, we, we do want people, um, black and brown residents to reside and remain in the district. But if they leave, their connectivity to the district doesn't end. And how can we, how can, you know, and it's almost like um, folks who are from other countries, from South America or wherever, they may be working and living in the United States, but they are contributing to their family because of that those times. And so I, I like that. And so Raymond, do you, I'd love, excuse me, um, Steve, if you could also chime in and, and um, share your reflections around what you think um, um, is the, you know, the connectivity and talk about how the digital divide is both a local and regional issue, specifically because your organization looks at the issue in that, from that lens. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, so much has been covered by Amanda, Lena, and Raymond in terms of the, the global nature of it, the hyperlocal, the policy lenses and levers. You know, so what I want to focus on a little bit more is, is the, uh, the micro geography in terms of it, of, of neighborhoods that need uh, increased access to not only digital infrastructure, but also computers and other access software and hardware that can help people get online and be more active. Uh, and then also the regional lens in which while employers, when they're thinking about moving here, say like an Amazon or Apple or something else, they are not looking at just Washington DC to Raymond's point and all the other points before, they're looking at a, a region. And so drawing talent from different parts of the area. And in order to do that properly, we're going to need to have people across the geography that really have access to these skills and this talent and the ability to get online uh, in order to make us hyper competitive. And then the policy lens of that really is how do we create a network? And that's really where the partnership is trying to leverage its voice, not only in this issue, but in others, including transportation and housing, mm -hmm. to really sit down the elected officials with the business community and say, like, what can we do to create standardized policies and procedures and programs across these you know, political geographic borders in order to make sure that as a unit, as a region, we're working toward the same thing. We're working toward every child being able to go online in this environment and learn. We're working, we're, we're working toward uh, making sure that everyone who can work from home is able to work from home and things of that nature. Um, so that's really how the business community has seen it and how I personally believe that is the um, building on top of the other panelists, how we can lean in as a business community uh, to support all this policy and programmatic efforts. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is for you, Alina. The immediate and potential long-term effects of the shutdown on DC and the region due to the pandemic only reaffirmed, and in some instances brought to light other issues related to the digital divide. Um, and we've touched a little bit about it in the other panel, but can you, can you talk a little bit about what is the potential impact of this divide on the district um, in the in the region's economic for the region's economic growth when you when we when we think about COVID and the and the impact that is having. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I you know, other panel also weigh in as well. I mean, we know that the digital divide in DC and in you know cities and regions across the country is a significant barrier to growth. And this was certainly true before the pandemic, but has been highlighted and exacerbated by the pandemic. And, you know, we've seen that folks trying to work remotely, to telework, um, to attend school and complete their homework remotely, need connectivity to do all of those things. And yet, 
the digital divide, as we know in DC, like many cities across the country, disproportionately affects black communities. Um, I know in DC, for example, the sort of average home broadband adoption in wards five, seven, and eight is 20, points, 20 percentage points lower than in the other wards. And, and so when we think about, you know, barriers to um, engaging in the workplace and also, you know, using, as Amanda was saying, all of the ingenuity and opportunities and human capital that people have to fully participate that the digital divide is a key barrier. Um, I also want to highlight a couple other ways in which the digital divide is, you know, impeding sort of inclusive economic growth. Um, some of this comes from a survey that the Urban Institute did back in May, where we asked city officials across the U.S. about how they were using technology during the pandemic. And I think one thing that we heard from a lot of folks is, in addition to barriers for, you know, job seekers, there are also considerable barriers for businesses that may not have internet connectivity, and that for many businesses without an online presence which are largely in low-income communities of color, they were most struggling to adapt during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, this is compounded by cities moving some of the services that support these small businesses, like permitting and licensing online, which creates an additional barrier for, you know, entrepreneurs or small business owners to um, fully participate when they don't have that connectivity. Um, Another dimension, we've talked a lot about sort of the social contract with residents, and I think that's something really important to examine, that as cities are, you know, now moving engagement online, you know, who can participate in that engagement and who is excluded? Of course, you know, folks who don't have that connectivity, but in addition to non-English speaking households, seniors, um, housing insecure, unhoused populations. And we know that when these groups are underrepresented in the dialogues and conversations that shape economic policy, they're less likely to be served by that policy. And so when we think about you know, recovery efforts from COVID-19 or economic growth policy moving forward, how do we make sure that you know, these folks' voices are really included and at the table in um, shaping the policy and outcomes? Um, and then sort of the last thing I want to mention is, uh, I know Nicole Turner Lee in the last panel was talking about sort of algorithmic discrimination. And I think that's something we're thinking about a lot too, that as you know, more and more companies are using sort of algorithmic uh, hiring tools, and we know that some of these tools can discriminate against uh, you know, black and brown workers or against women, how that will affect sort of inclusive economic growth moving forward. Excellent. Um, you, you highlighted something that we're, we're talking about on, um, with our small business of stakeholders, and it really is, I think that um, the pandemic and the shutdown also kind of highlighted for small businesses that have not kept pace with technology. The fact that they don't have a digital, they don't have a web-based presence. Um, uh, and having to gear that up and learn that, you know, in a crisis situation is really challenging. And being able to maintain that, um, because I think, you know, by embracing technology and using it and embedding it into how your, your service delivery and how you work with your customers, um, you get better at it over time. And so if you're not familiar with it, it can be intimidating. Um, and because so, so many people are looking and trying to connect with people and services online, um, this puts them at a, at a disadvantage. And so that is really one particular um, connective, connective issue um, as it relates to this. Um, and then also, I, I like the, what you talked about in terms of the voices of community. Um, we really need to figure out a better way to engage their voices because it's with their voices that we can actually begin to kind of lift up and, and, and ensure that this, this issue and this movement gains momentum. And it's not just a subset, um, but it, it, because it touches so many people. So thank you for that. Um, uh, so, so Steve and uh, Elena, I'm gonna throw this question in Raymond um, to you. Um, when we look at the, but uh, what's the role do you see of the private and public sector in playing is, should be playing in providing leadership to support digital inclusion and narrowing this gap? And what more can they be doing that they're not doing right now? Uh, I can I can start uh, when I'm I'm going to answer the question first is the the private sector and then moving on to the the public sector. I think what the private sector can do is set a, an agenda and a vision. So as individuals who uh, we've talked about geographic and political boundaries, right? The private sector outlives those in some respects, where a governor is going to be four to eight years of business, a corporation like Northrop Grumman has been in the region uh, for, for 10 times that. So how can the private sector then really put its uh, flag in the ground and really speak as a long-term stakeholder to why these issues are extremely important? And then using that you know, power 
and those resources bring together elected officials across state boundaries, as we talked about before on the regional side, to making sure that we're connecting the dots uh, to make sure that we can increase inclusion digitally across the entire region. I also think the private sector could always lend its dollars. Of course, that's something that I think sometimes people or the private sector complains people come to them too many, too, too many times for. Uh, but those dollars and funding specific programs that can serve as pilots for policy. So in that lens, I'll talk about our capital collab a little bit. We have another sub project in which we're working with five jurisdictions across the region, Prince George's, Montgomery, the district, Baltimore City and Fairfax County, along with the skills that are needed for the new digital economy. So that's not entirely within the realm of digital inclusion exactly, but it, helping those students really understand what skills are gonna be needed for them to get the high paying jobs. And that is from the private sector really outlining the KSAs and knowledge skills and abilities that they see are necessary to get the, the machine learning jobs, the engineering jobs of the future. And then I think if you wanna think more flexibly from the private sector, you can think about benefits, right? So everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people here probably had transit benefits before the shutdown, really. So how, how can you think about electronic benefits? How can you think about digital benefits? Uh, is it broadband, are extra computers, more digital access? Like what could it be? as a part of the overall package that you give to employees that really can trickle down to families so that they can have the tools necessary uh, in order to really, uh, to be more, to plug in more to the economy. Um, on the public sector side, I think it's just a willingness uh, to invest dollars. And I know that's extremely difficult right now, but also to take the pilots that the private sector and potentially philanthropy are really doing and really attune them because the public, the private sector, while willing to spend dollars or while willing to really do some of these pilots, are not the end all be all in terms of implementation, mm -hmm. and not usually, you know, honestly, the best in terms of what makes sense for the entire uh, population. So, really taking those learnings and then applying it to a more public lens to make sure that these programs are truly inclusive and really help everyone across the income spectrum and geographical spectrum get the skills and, and the materials that they need. Thanks. Raymond? So on the, on the public side, let's talk about the, um, the employers. So what I would love for them to do more of, and we've started to do this our, ourselves within our organization, have them become bigger advocates um, when it comes to um, um, see council, the mayor's office. So for example, I like to give examples or tell stories. I think it helps me help me explain what we built and how it can impact. So we recruited some of our biggest and best partners. I'm talking about the ones that have the contracts at the Pentagon, the one that the, the contracts where they've hired 50, 60 graduates and paid them $50,000 almost right out of the classroom. And it came with a secret, a secret clearance. We asked Sean Connor from 22nd Century to go downtown and testify, not just on our behalf, but behalf of IT training and opportunities for more young adults, 18 to 24, did a great job. So my goal is to find the uh, the Cevatex, the, the CACIs, and convince them to get in front of the council and the mayor and make them aware of the opportunities that really do exist for kids right out of high school or maybe a year or two of college. Because I just feel we still haven't convinced a lot of people who are the decision makers for funding for training programs like Hope Project, Bite Back, and others that kids with a ninth grade reading level can still work at khaki. How do I know that and why can I advocate for that? Because we put people there, hundreds of them that are, um, that's their, their situation. So on the, on the, on the, on the private side, I'm sorry, on the, on the public side, on, in terms of council mayor and ANCs and everybody else, if we can get to the point where they would believe in IT, I still feel like it's a, it's a stepchild to, to other industries. And this is after me the last 10 years constantly producing like ridiculous numbers in terms of credentials and more importantly, putting people to work. So I would love to see a panel of folks like myself and people from Bite Back and, and, and Joe Wynn um, from the Vets Group and um, someone from maybe Ms. Uh, Ms. Robeson's um, office of OIC organization to be able to sit at the table and be a part of um, how funding gets distributed and how you um, determine success within uh, the programs. Because what, and when, what the, for my biggest fear is that all these talented training providers, they're going to, especially now with, with the pandemic, they're going to start going away 
because they can't afford to remain in existence because of the way things are set up. And I think it's just a matter of uh, the, 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 the public sector not being educated enough about how this stuff like, really works. But the biggest example I can give you, and I'll shut up after this, is we get a lot of our training dollars uh, that are we overfunded. And there's all kinds of guidelines. Those guidelines have prevented us, prevented us from helping kids at times. And it drives me crazy. It brings tears to my eyes when we can't include a kid because they don't meet the criteria. Maybe they don't have an, enough barriers to be eligible, but if they don't get in a program like ours, they're going to have those barriers, meaning justice involved um, and homelessness and all this, these other kind of issues that, uh, that people face. So that would, that would be my, my response to public and private and how they can help. Can you give an example of, of, of another example in terms of how we owe or you know some of these um, um, policies and that are in place um, to improve the systems and how they can actually work against us because there's this sliver or this um, population. Yes. yes, and I'm gonna try not to cry when I share it with you. We had a we had a young man in our program. He wasn't necessarily ready for the program, and in the past, when we weren't under the we owe guidelines, we could continue to work with that kid for the entire six months. But under the WIOA guidelines, we are under pressure to perform. So we get one week to determine whether or not a young person is a good fit. And we wanted to give him a chance. We rolled the dice with him. He proved us, he proved to us that he wasn't ready. So we had to let him go. In the past, we would have kept that person because we had additional funding, which means we had additional staff to support a young person that had very unique challenges. The saddest part, this young man's mom begged me to allow him to stay in the program. I'm talking real tears. She was telling me about how he had grew up, all the different tragedies that happened in his life and in people's lives around him. She said, Mr. Bear, I don't even care if he doesn't even get a job in IT. I don't care if he doesn't get a credential. I need him to be around people like you and your team. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we still couldn't keep him because of those real those guidelines, because if we don't meet the guidelines, we may not be able to get a class the following year. We had to dismiss the young man from the program. Less than three months, he was uh, he got shot and killed on 8th and H Northeast. Yes. So in a sense, I feel like I have blood on my hands because I know if I could have found a way to keep them, that young man would have never turned to the streets. It was so sad I couldn't even go to the funeral because I know his mother would have said, I told you. I told you. I didn't want to tell that story because it always, I always tear up about it because that's a real example of how policies and procedures impact real people's lives. Oh, by the way, his cousin, who was also in the class that had similar challenges, we allowed him to stay. And of course it didn't work out for him either because we didn't have all the resources to coach and mentor a person like that. Three weeks ago or four weeks ago, um, he got shot out real bad. We don't even know the status of him right now. So this is real. And I need to tell these kind of stories because I want people to know this is not just names on pieces of paper these are real human beings and the saddest part there were kids just like him in the earlier cohorts when we had a different kind of funding and didn't have those kind of requirements we were able to coach and mentor them and we all laugh about how crazy and immature they used to act back in the day as they say yes thank you for sharing that you're welcome Alina um, can you um, add to this um, conversation in terms of yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, following up from Stephen and Raymond to your story, I think, you know, the private companies can, yeah, provide their dollars, provide their support to, you know, fund excellent initiatives like Raymond's work and uh, like providing, you know, the resources that uh, enable these programs to serve communities and change lives. Um, and, you know, I think at a more macro level, we're seeing how, you know, cities are working collaboratively with private companies to really accelerate their ability to provide resources to help students and help workers um, you know, more effectively connect during the pandemic. And cities are obtaining you know, new procurement authorities to enable them to move a lot faster in collaboration with these private companies than perhaps they would have before the pandemic. Um, I think one thing that I think about a lot is sort of what's the long-term strategy that you know, a concern I have is these measures to 
you know, distribute hotspots and laptops and tablets are incredibly important, but you know, not long-term solutions that really change the infrastructure of um, the digital divide. And I think there, you know, cities have tools to sort of policy levers that can incentivize, you know, some of these private companies to more equitably serve all communities. And I know that came up in the Q&A in the last panel. Um, you know, one example that I really like here is the city of Los Angeles has included in their permitting requirements for companies that want to install 5G small cell in the city that they need to demonstrate that they're equitably serving low income neighborhoods and wealthy neighborhoods in order to be issued a permit and sort of using that power of permitting to uh, nudge and incentivize companies towards you know, creating a more equitable uh, broadband infrastructure um, is sort of one way that cities can use their policy tools to you know, think more long-term and create a system that equitably serves everyone you know, through the pandemic and beyond. Thank you. So um, this next question um, is focused on um, system level change. What system level changes are needed to ensure that our workforce system is preparing low skilled workers for the types of jobs that are increasingly in, increasing in demand and requiring intermediate level skills in today's economy? Um, Amanda and Raymond, do you want to take that question? Sure. sure. Raymond, um, I'll, I'll follow up after you. Great. Right. I want to start off just by acknowledging um, the story that Raymond just told. Right? That's an example of policy not working. Right? That's not about we need to change people to fit the policy. That's about we need to change policy to accommodate the reality of people's lives. And I'm a policy advocate, not because I'm interested in policy on an abstract level, but because I care about policy as a way to make people's lives better. And when I heard Raymond's story, what I saw in my head was the young people in the high school program that I used to run in Philadelphia and the hopes and dreams that they had and the ways in which their hopes and dreams could be jeopardized by policies that they did not have a lot of power to try to change. So when I think about sort of, you know, your question, Yvette, on what kind of system level changes are needed to ensure that the workforce system can really help people prepare for jobs, the first thing I want to think about is how do we best ensure that people with a lived experience of how policy plays out in reality have a voice at the policymaking table? That's why I work for National Skills Coalition. We work every day to try to bring the voices of people who are directly affected by policy in the policymakers' conversations. So let me give a few very concrete examples of things that could happen differently. The first is very simple, and that's really around better, um, more creative use of existing policies to support digital inclusion. So I'm gonna put in the chat now a link to a blog post that I did a couple of months ago about how um, uh, people can use TANF, SNAP ENT, WIOA, and CARES Act funding to support digital inclusion. SNAP, of course, being the food stamp program, the employment and training piece of that, TANF being temporary assistance for needy families, um, WIOA being the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which we've just talked about, and CARES being the COVID relief bill that Congress passed back in March. None of these are a magic bullet. None of these are a perfect solution, but each of them can be a piece of the puzzle in better addressing digital inclusion issues, either by buying loaner laptops or Wi-Fi hotspots that can be given to participants, by supporting staff time to pay for digital literacy classes, or other kinds of, of support. So that's step one. Step two is to think about how do we take the expertise that we have from low-income workers who are already using technology on the job and use that to better inform job training programs. In the past two weeks, I've had conversations with um, the head of employee training for L'Oreal Cosmetics, who is supervising 1,200 workers here in the U.S. around, uh, you know, what kind of tech skills do you need to have to work at a beauty company? Um, I've talked to folks in precision agriculture in North Dakota, talking about the kind of agricultural um, the, the sensors you have to be able to use to work in a greenhouse uh, to, to be able to do that. Um, I've heard about examples of Boeing using augmented reality 
which is if you've ever played Pokemon Go or used a Snapchat filter, you know what augmented reality is, um, to do aircraft assembly, right? So manufacturing workers looking at a schematic. Um, construction workers are using smart helmets that can show a blueprint sort of projected on to um, the, the items they're holding in their hands as they're assembling parts on the job. Right? So there's a million ways in which even low-income workers are already being called upon to use tech on the job. Walmart has a half a dozen apps that their frontline workers are expected to be able to use. You have to use the inventory app. You have to use the price change app. You have to use the HR app. So how do we take that expertise that people are learning on the job and then translate that into better training for other low-income workers who are trying to get not just an entry-level job, but a career path job that can help them support their family? So closing that feedback loop and getting that expertise of, of frontline workers and employers is really important. The last two pieces I'll mention, um, you know, we need new investment. Congress has introduced the Digital Equity Act. That would be a great start. Um, but we need policymakers to invest in digital skills in the same way that they recognize that they need to invest in K-12 education and higher education. This is a fundamental component of any kind of workforce and education investment that they should be making from now on. And my organization has some specific recommendations around that, which I'll be happy again to drop in the chat, but that it absolutely needs to involve new investment. And then the last piece of the puzzle is really, again, going back to this question of um, employer expertise, right? Particularly for small and mid-sized employers. They can't create their own in-house training programs because they don't have the resources to do that. But they can partner with nonprofit community-based organizations like Goodwill or the YWCA, which are both doing great uh, programs in different parts of the country, including in some cases in the D.C. area, um, to really develop training programs that connect directly to the kinds of jobs that they are hiring people for now and that have good pay and good benefits. And so the more we can close that feedback loop, the more we avoid what our former, former labor secretary in the Obama administration used to call train and pray. Right? We don't want to train and then just pray you get a job. Yep. We want to know that there's a real-life job waiting for you at the end of that program. And many of the folks on today's panel are running exactly those kinds of programs. But as a policy advocate, those are my recommendations for systems-level change. Thank you. So I'll be um, brief. Amanda did a great job of, of hitting a lot of the points that I was probably going to uh, bring up. A couple of things I will say, though, is we got to extend the amount of training. We have to increase the per pupil allotment for a person going through uh, a training program. I'm the biggest advocate in the city. Everybody knows this. I'm always constantly asking them to increase what they give us to deliver this quality training. My students on average make $62,500. I have over 40 students that make $100,000 a year or more. My top student makes $400,000 a year. He has a $250,000 job and a $150,000 job. I mentioned that is over in Afghanistan. He's bringing home 230 grand. He doesn't pay any taxes and they cover his food. <laughs> well, he's on a base, he can't really go anywhere. And his housing. He's saving to buy a house back here in DC. He's, he, he closes in, in October. Here's the important part to this. Based on what I just said, picture this. Young man graduated from DeMatha, goes off to college, Mom and dad writes a check for $200,000 for Morehouse. He's going to pursue a career in information technology. He's down there for four years. His cell phone has never been off. He's never had to worry about food, housing, or anything. These kind of stories always uh, I get emotional about because I'm living it. Because I'm, I'm sitting and talking to these young men and women every day about how far they've come and trying to convince people to think better of themselves and be more um, aggressive about building a career. That young person that has that background, my student, the kid that went to Anacostia that's 19 or 20 years old, I get three to six months with him. We get very little <laughs> resources to prepare that young person to compete against that kid that just went to Morehouse and got a, we already know his background of resources, his parents. He's going to show up for an entry-level IT help desk job with a degree that says Morehouse, one of the top HBCUs in this country. 
his mom and dad wrote a check for two hundred thousand dollars. My student, my twenty year old student, has to compete against him for that same entry level job. That is not a fair fight. But the expectation is when they leave Hope Project and they go on an internship for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, right after that, they're going to land a job making forty five, fifty thousand dollars. The same job that kid went to Morehouse. That is not a fair fight on paper, but somehow we've been able to develop our people, uh, um, young and old, not just um, young people, to compete against people with degrees in information technology, and we're winning. So if we can just get the, the city and this country to pour more money into developing people for careers, I'm going to speak specifically about IT right now because it seems like all the other industries get all kinds of love. Um, even down to the apprenticeships, we were talking about, um, I didn't chance to mention this before, when we started talking about um, private sector. I've just partnered with Anne Arundel County, and they're going to start an apprenticeship program, and I'm helping them identify Maryland-based companies, and we're not going to do a traditional apprenticeship. We're going to do an incumbent worker apprenticeship. So we're going to take the kid who went to maybe a whole project or a bite back and got an entry-level help desk job and turn him into a cybersecurity um, professional. They're going to fund, um, fund the training for us to deliver it, and the company's going to get free training for their staff members to build a career. So in a case like that, everybody wins. Anne Arundel County in Maryland gets a great new program they can showcase. We get a chance to continue to develop, in a lot of cases, our folks or people that went to, to bite back. And then the employer, the, the quote, unquote, the private sector, they have this person they're getting quality training for at no cost. So it's, it's a case where everybody wins. But y'all, please don't forget the story about the kid from Anacostia and the kid that went to Morehouse, both of them looking for that entry level IT help desk job. Great. So I have a final question for, the, for, um, for Stephen and Raymond. Um, and if anybody else wants to chime in, can you talk a, about a little bit about what you see is the return, and you've hinted on it already, what is the return on investment for employers? Um, the technology sector when we make diversity, equity, and inclusion a priority? Um, I'm happy to go first, and I'll leave most of the time for, for you, Stephen. I think um, my guy over at the Pentagon, um, Sean Connor from 22nd Century, is a really, really good example. When you build it, they will come. I've never, ever in the last nine years had a call a recruiter or somebody that's hiring and say, hey, I got some people. Can you help them find employment? They call me. When you build something good, they'll come. You don't have to worry about the private sector and the companies. They want our students. Literally, they blow my phone up looking for people. Just kind of call the other day looking for somebody with a, a secret clearance and the pay was only $25. I was like, I'm not even going to send it to my student if you can't get it at least to 32. Because if you got a secret clearance and you got an A plus and a year or two of experience, I feel, I feel you should be making that much. They came right back and said, yep, send me the resumes, we'll pay it. Because if you build it, um, they, they will come. I, I think that's what I want, the point I wanted to, to get across um, regarding this particular question. And I saw I was like, this is exactly the time to share this kind of stuff. The, the, the employment opportunities are there. We just got to build the right candidates. It takes resources to build them. Yeah, I mean, I think... First of all, I am that kid that went to Morehouse. So that was really hilarious, Raymond. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, that's that's very that's, that hits home. And I can I can echo some of those thoughts of you know going to college in Atlanta and uh, having four years and having essentially a, a, a lot of uh, strong black male influences teaching you how to yeah. dress, how to talk, how to interview, and the soft skills that are very helpful in in landing entry level jobs, which as we know, then put you on the trajectory for all types of other other work. So totally agree uh, there. In terms of the ROI, I would like to take it from, you know, several different levels. One, you know, regionally and locally, as we talked about before, like what um, some research from the Urban Institute, and this has consistently been also in Brookings and others and, and new skills, um, social skills programs rather, is that more diverse uh, economies, more inclusive economies are stronger, right? They weather recessions better, they grow faster, they grow stronger. And so by including people who have been left out of the talent pipeline for these skills, you're not only you know, doing them a favor and doing their family a favor, you're actually increasing the vibrancy and resiliency of your entire ecosystem, which is extremely important, right? Then for the ROI of the employer directly, you, know, you are seeing employers by definition make money off of their employees or else they're out of business. So every, every, no matter what you pay, your employer is getting more money off of you than what you receive. Therefore, they, you are employed. 
Um, and so with people and these tech skills that you're able to really uh, scale up quickly, the investment, even though it needs to be more, as Raven had mentioned, is actually relatively low to the salary and the ROI that you receive on the back end. And I think you can look at anything from this, the salaries you see at Google or Amazon or whoever that seem exorbitant. But then when you look at those balance sheets, you see that they are making way more money off of these people than you could even ever think. Uh, another example of that, I've, we've said a lot about the traditional like Silicon Valley and those firms, you know, a group that sits at our table and also sees himself as a tech institution is Exelon. So they have uh, numerous uh, different subsidiaries from Pepco, BGE, all up and down the region, the technical skills around computer technology, digital inclusion, and really work on the nuclear side of their work in electronics. Um, has really strengthened them as, and their own personal commitment as Exelon to equity, promoting people of diverse backgrounds, has really led to them being, and they, they will say this proudly, the number one energy provider in the United States. And so really, it's not only just about creating a strong ecosystem, it's not only about making more money for yourself, but really then just taking over the market and being the strongest uh, that you can be. Uh, so there's really no, and then you even have research from Harvard Business Review and others that diverse teams are stronger teams. Not surprising. I mean, if you see it from the, the global view down in terms of regional diversity is stronger, uh, having people with diverse backgrounds attack problems differently, and you usually get a better solution. And so um, it's just all across the board, better for everyone uh, to be more inclusive. Great, great. I would love for uh, the Washington Business Journal, and they may already do it, but to do a diversity and equity inclusion, you know, um, you know, highlighting the companies that are leading the pack and leading that charge. Um, I'm always struck when I look at, at, at the Washington Business Journal and, you know, they do an excellent job, but, you know, I was, I'm always struck when they do a feature and looking at the best companies and they show all the employees and you flip through and you're like, where is the diversity? Yes. You know? And so... <laughs> You know, and it, and and if it's if it's happening at the top level, you know it's happening ha happening all throughout the, the the organization. So, so thank you so much. I want to thank all the panelists um, for this engaging conversation to, um, um, and and helping to kind of um, deepen the conversation from the first panel. This is this has been excellent. I, I want to thank you for your time. Um, we're going to close out. I, I don't think we have questions, uh, time for questions, but we have a poll that we want to ask. It, um, for folks who are still joining us, please answer the poll. Do you, um, do you want to participate in increasing digital equity in the district? And while you're completing the poll, I want to um, remind folks about the call to action. Um, we hope that the you know that this discussion was helpful in, in helping you to think about how you can make a difference around this issue around digital equi equity. And so the call to action is is um, is multi prong. One is for um, district government agencies and elect officials. We want them to see the digital inclusion as a priority for black and brown residents and for the district economy and regionally. Um, not for nonprofits, please consider how to increase digital inclusion in your programming. Employers and businesses, please support digital inclusion and hire graduates of programs like Bike, Bike Back and Hope Project and help build a digital economy that includes black and brown residents. And then finally, um, individuals, you know, we want you to stay tuned, to keep in touch with Bite Back, with CNHED, um, to be a part of a, of a future campaign. We'd love for you to sign up. Um, there was a Google, um, there was a link um, that was put in the chat. It may be put, um, posted again in the chat. And it's basically a form for you to kind of sign up to be a part of this campaign and part of this movement. We need all voices, all, um, all stakeholders, because we're all impacted by these issues um, and, and how it, 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 it bleeds or threads throughout the whole community. Um, and so we want to thank you again for joining us. Um, and so I just want to show the results before we close out. So great. Um, to see that 72% of you want to join as, as part of the advocacy effort to um, advance this subject and you and where you fit in, in this uh, call to action. And we'll be following up with you if you please fill out the form that's dropped in the chat. 
And as we close out, I want to encourage folks to also visit CNHED's website. We have a couple of more events taking place um, this week, and we are closing out the week with um, a conversation with corporate philanthropists. And that is actually a, a great um, conversation to participate in when we talk about um, this issue around digital inclusion and um, to see if that's, this is on their radar and how they can leverage their influence um, investments to help advance this issue. So I also want to encourage you to continue to tweet throughout the day, um, hash the hashtag digital um, equity DC. Um, and want to thank our sponsors for Community Development Week. Um, and we also want to just thank our partnership with both Fight Back and with um, Fight Back and Capital um, uh, Clubhouse. Thank you all, thank you to all the panelists, and thank you for an excellent conversation. So let's sign up and stay involved in this equity, digital equity movement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, guys. Thanks, everyone.